Today we have Sonia Poulton on the podcast. This podcast is going to go over everything from Jimmy Savile to more contemporary big story in that category, Epstein. We've got a whole slew of political names that are going to come up. And I have watched Sonia's documentary three times now. It's just absolutely blown my mind the level of research she has done into this. And whereas you see some people putting videos out really sensationalizing and getting into the most extreme claims, what I like about Sonia is that she draws the line at an appropriate place and it enhances the credibility of what she's about to tell us. But before we go to that dark realm, how are you qualified to speak on this subject? Well, um, apart from the fact that I was actually abused as a child, mm. so I do understand that, um, but that isn't really my entrance. My entrance was meeting people who had been extensively abused as children, finding an empathy with them, understanding them, where they were coming from, seeing that their biggest problems were actually dealing with the system and challenging the system that had enabled them to be abused. Why were you meeting these people? Just in the course of being a journalist, um, for almost 20 years now, I have been writing and researching about the sexualization of children. And obviously there's an overlap, a clear overlap, because the sexualization of children is what society is enabling, whether that's via pop stars or whether ideologies or or the sort of, you know, the wholesale acceptance of porn for children. Um, so children have been sexualized for a long time and it, it, it interested me greatly. And I think probably um, the, the turning point for me was when my daughter was six and uh, Bratz dolls were released. And I don't know if you remember Bratz dolls, but they were dolls that looked like hookers. They wore chain mail, they wore stockings, they had big inflatable lips like the Kardashians, like Katie Price. And I said, who, who would buy these for their children? Barbie was bad enough, you know, but who would buy these for their children? And I looked into it and I discovered that the man who had actually created them had been inspired by watching school children in their short little dresses, queuing up for the bus outside his house in the morning. <sighs> and you just have to wonder about it. And so the very first article I wrote in a British newspaper was about the Bratz dolls. And that was, well, now about 17, 18 years ago. And that then led me down that path. And what is the purpose for you to be on this mission what is it giving you oh i don't know other than lots of headaches lots of threats being wired to the metropolitan police being smeared being attacked um i think what it gives me is i always say that what i do is not a career it's a calling and so there's something very deep inside of me that clearly feels the need to, you know, to, I don't know, right some wrongs. I was orphaned at the age of 11. And so mm. I think part of the problem was that I, because I didn't have a voice as a child, I was, and I came from very lower working class background. So lower working class background, you don't have a voice anyway. And certainly if you're orphaned. And so I was very, very determined that nobody else would find themselves in that position if they encountered me, that I would help give them a voice. You said threats. How serious were these threats? Very serious. Um, from, let me see now, uh, from 2013, I can actually pinpoint the date, June 6th, 2014 was when um, that was, it was after that, after the Jimmy Savile revelations, I started looking more and more into abuse in North Wales care homes where a lot of it emanated from. I started looking at what was going on in the city of London, what was going on in terms of Masonic um, properties and all these different things that I was hearing about. And then I started receiving very harrowing messages. We're coming after you. You're going down. This went on for six years. I, no, I found them. I tracked them down. Five of them in a gang. And I compiled my own case for the Metropolitan Police, 400 pages of documented evidence, which included them wanting to set me on fire, bury me alive. They wrote all this on the internet. They weren't messing around. They wanted everybody to know they hated me. They, the, there are still blogs up now which defame me in exactly the same way, say that I'm responsible for the death of child abuse victims, which is obviously an absolute lie. Anyway, to cut a very long story short, three weeks before the case was due to be heard at Kingston Crown Court, the case was dropped and my stalker announced that he was given a core participant role at the child abuse inquiry three days after my case was dropped. Holy... So that tells you they're protected and they're intertwined. 
And you said something about being wired to the police. Yeah, what? I had. Well, the Metropolitan Police were so alarmed by the yeah. the, the degree of threat. Yeah. Um, and the problem was, is that uh, I wasn't protected, even though I'm in the Equalities Act. I'm a protected characteristic by my sex, but I wasn't being protected. And in fact, one of the cops said to me, if you were gay and Muslim, we'd be able to sort you out immediately. And the same applies if I was gay or Jewish or any any other demographic other than just being white. That was a that was a problem for me. And so I had to compile my own case. They were so alarmed that one of the stalkers had put a Google Earth shot of my home online instructing their pedo friends. They were sex abusers and their sex attackers in this gang. One of the women involved, her brother, raped a woman so badly she required a colostomy bag for life. Mm. So we are talking about vicious, violent people who will do anything they can to silence you. Anything. So I was wired up to the Metropolitan Police for three years. When we moved house, I said, I want that alarm to go because the problem about an alarm is it alarms you. That is the problem. And I said, I want that alarm to go and I want to be able to stand up to them. I have actually done Taekwondo is I can take care of myself. I, <gasps> I don't mess around. So so if I need to, I will I will fight. Wow. Oh, oh my goodness. <sighs> I'm, I'm, I'm like speechless. Um, oh don't be. So, <laughs> There's more. <laughs> so, I've watched your documentary three times now. It's called Pedophiles in Parliament. It is. What was the imp impetus to take it to the documentary level like that? I got very, very frustrated. What I'm primarily a mainstream media journalist. One of my main jobs is I am a consulting editor at one of our main news channels, which is not the BBC, by the way, because they have a dirty house and they need to be sorted out. But that's a whole other story. Um, but I won't say who because my stalkers will go after my um, my my main job, which is what they always do. Um, but I so I've been a contributing editor um, for well, actually since 2013, and we have done a lot of lot of different stories. We were the first to break the contaminated blood scandal. We were the first to ask for a child abuse inquiry. Um, so I forgot what your question was. Um, the impetus. Oh yeah, the impetus. To this to the documentary. So I level. became increasingly frustrated, Sean, that only a smidge of what was actually I felt I could prove and I could evidence would make it to air. That made me very, very frustrated. And I work all across mainstream media. Good morning, Britain. This morning, LBC, all, Sky, everywhere as a journalist, but I still couldn't take this information. And so I thought this is really insane. People need to be able to piece this together. The final straw for me was the Carl Beach situation because as Lord McAlpine, who had been previously accused of being a paedophile and is now dead, had quite accurately said in his book that what you need to do is you need, and I say this in paedophiles in Parliament, I think you're probably aware of the, the point that I'm talking about, and that is what you need to do is you need to basically isolate somebody. You need to prove that what they're saying is wrong, and then the rest of the story will be discredited, which is what has happened. You cannot get a story about a suspected paedophile in parliamentary circles on air or anywhere near it for love and money after Carl Beach. That's done. So I had to do it. I had to do it because none of us know how long we're here for. And so we could go at any time and I cannot leave knowing the amount of information that I have that I haven't passed on to the world. If you want to watch Sonia's documentary, it's on YouTube, Paedophiles in Parliament. If you just click down below this video, actually, to the description box, there's a link. You can just watch it right there from that link. And all the other links to Sonia's socials and all of her work will be in the description box as well. So I urge you to click down and support what Sonia's doing. So the documentary starts out with the Dickens files. Does Can indeed. you explain what the Dickens files were? Well, there was actually two lots of Dickens files, but we only knew one. And of course, what's happened now is, is Jeffrey Dickens was an MP, uh, a conservative MP. I'm naturally Labour born and bred, although Labour is completely sold out on this issue. And certainly currently, which I'm sure we'll get round to, cu currently Labour is extremely problematic in terms of, of child protection, extremely problematic. But Geoffrey Dickens was a Conservative MP who had been given certain information and he was able to pull together a series of files in which he cited people in parliamentary circles who may be abusing children. And he handed those to Leon Britton, or at least he handed one of those files to Leon Britton. Now, Leon Britton, if anybody knows, was also accused right up until his death of being a paedophile. 
Um, and certainly there were accusations of him involved with Elm Guest House in southwest London. We certainly know that Cyril Smith was at Elm Guest House. There were other politicians at Elm Guest House and there was abuse taking place at Elm Guest House. Um, and so Geoffrey Dickens compiled these files, gave it to Leon Britton, the home of Home Secretary of the Day, and essentially nothing was done of it. He was ridiculed. He had his office broken into. He tried to expose the fact that Jeremy Corbyn, who was then Islington, still is, uh, Islington MP, and of course is now leader of the uh, Labour Party, had uh, not done anything about the child abuse that was taking place in Islington. Equally, Margaret Hodge, who was leader of Islington Council. So Geoffrey Dickin had done everything he could to try and expose these people, but they they did what they always do. They portrayed him as a nutter. He's crazy. He's got mental health problems. Like they, they said because he was put through the foster care system, that must have messed with his mind. They did everything they could to tar him other than be prepared to look at what was really taking place. Why do they not want to look at what is really taking place? The, I said to an editor about six years ago, the British people are not ready to be exposed to the misdeeds of our establishment because we build our lives on ideas and foundations that we take for granted. Most people are, would be horrified to discover the level of corruption that takes place in government, in local council, in any parts of the establishment. Um, and so they have to protect themselves. They literally have to protect themselves. I mean, this is what politicians do. They have to protect their party, which is why Margaret Thatcher surrounded herself with paedophiles. I mean, even her own assistant was a paedophile who Edwina Curry noted in her own book that uh, Sir Peter Morrison was a noted pederast. And yet these people were still allowed to be in parliament. They were Get awarded, um, and so they protect each other. What what did they have on Margaret Thatcher, for example? So in answer to your question, you know, why don't they want to be exposed? Well, these people all have something on each other, and child abuse is the currency that they they have used for decades. So you mentioned Edwina Curry, yes. And one of the most compelling parts about the documentary was you went on the Nolan radio show. Can you run down what happened? Because the subject was changed, wasn't Actually, it? Actually, twice we went. We uh, Edwina and I went head to head twice, and I think. I can't remember in the documentary, is that where she starts to threaten me about being careful what okay, I say? Okay, so it starts out, and you guys are talking about surveillance yes. and how she believed that MI6 had the right to listen to everything that she was saying because yeah. that was in the interest of democracy and yeah. freedom and protects the country. Sure. And then you said, no, MI6 needs to be checked about how they're taking liberties you know, and then and then all of a sudden you change the subject over to paedophiles. Yes, I do that. Yes, I do that. Once I've got them in a place, I like to be able to switch it on them because it, the problem is these people are protected even when they go on wherever. Nolan Show or wherever in mainstream media, they're usually told in advance what their questions are. Now, actually, the Nolan Show deliberately brought me on to have a go at her, right? Because I was on with her only two weeks prior to that and we got into an argument about she felt that that the military should go in and, and into schools and start disciplining children. Well, I'm not coming from that place. I'm all for <sighs> home education if it's down to me. So Edwina and I couldn't be further apart in many respects, but I was also very aware that she knew about paedophiles in Parliament and had done nothing about them, pretty much like people like Esther Ranson, et cetera, et cetera, who were very aware of the gossip that had taken place and had done nothing. So Edwina Curry was that sort of person. As far as I'm concerned, she's an enabler and she should have been always tackled about that. She didn't hide it. She put it in her book. But journalists, so mainstream media, are very compliant and it's more about public relations than anything else. And so after we'd had a little head-to-head -head a couple of weeks before, the producer rang me and said, do you fancy doing the paper review with Edwina Curry? And I said, do I? So it was actually two hours of paper reviews from that clip we argued almost non-stop throughout it like about everything every point we completely disagree because we would we would because she upholds the establishment whereas i believe the establishment not necessarily needs to be torn down but it needs to be forensically examined and bleached um and so that was really it i was just saying to her you you knew about what was going on what you know what what are you going to do about it of course she warned me then i received then i was I never appeared on the Nolan show again for four years and only just appeared again last year, I think. So they do that. They when you 
when you go a bit too far, which is what I tend to do. Well, no, I think I take up to the point. I never do anything illegal because then they'll get you. And I never say anything which sounds conspiratorial unless I can back it up because then they'll get you as well. Because what they're looking to do is be able to rubbish what you're saying. So, yeah, so that was sort of the background, you know, behind it. I don't like Edwina. There's no love lost between us. She certainly doesn't like me. She's one of the MPs who absolutely should be before the child abuse inquiry answering questions. And she's not. So researchers have claimed that the people are allowed to get to the top of politics and the top of business in many instances are either psychopaths or right. people who've been completely corrupted so that they can be blackmailed. Right. With Epstein, we saw massive names like Clinton, Bill Clinton, yeah. Prince Andrew, yeah. and Epstein was possibly filming them in acts with children. They were procuring children from Royal Palm Beach High School was one of, one of the main sources from the police records that I've read. Do you feel then that people like Thatcher would know the full extent of what her colleagues were doing in terms of paedophilia, but that enabled them to have leverage over them? Difficult. Um, I protested outside Thatcher's funeral. I was so incensed that we were spending £10 million on a woman who I felt had covered up child abuse on top of her many other crimes. Um, and I protested outside her funeral. I was that angry. There's a video online of me surrounded by Thatcherites, like going, you know, why are you here? And I'm like, she enabled the abuse of children. And uh, um, because I always feel that you have to make a point, you have to make a stand, even if you're on your own. Do you have a YouTube channel with that on it, with your videos on it? It's on my Facebook page. Okay, do you have a YouTube channel? I do have a YouTube okay, channel. Okay, we'll put the link to Sonia's YouTube channel in the yeah, description Yeah, I box. do. I have yeah. two YouTube channels, one for my mainstream media work and one for my independent okay. work. Um, I think it's very difficult. I know um, Barry Strevens, who was Margaret Thatcher's personal bodyguard. I have worked with the men who worked with Barry, and I have heard Barry personally say that he told Margaret Thatcher that Morrison was having parties at the weekend in his house in Cheshire with young boys. And she did nothing about it. In fact, she then followed that by making him a sir. So, and she promoted him. She promoted him within her party. I, look, Jimmy Savile spent at least 12 Christmases at Chequers. You do not get to spend time with the Prime Minister unless you have been seriously vetted by the security services. I think Thatcher must have known. She must have known. I can't see how she couldn't know. And if she didn't know, then that's almost remiss on her part. She certainly was informed. And it's up to her then to explore it further. She was certainly informed that one of her closest aides was messing around with young boys. I think that would be enough information for most people to pursue, really. And she knew there were a lot of people in her cabinet, in the in the Conservative cabinet. This is not, this is not, I'm not, this is not a pro-Labour stance, trust me. I have many issues with Labour and paedophiles. But Margaret Thatcher was protecting her cabinet in the same way as Theresa May then protected her cabinet, in the same way, way as no doubt Boris will protect the cabinet. So we're going to get to Cameron and May. Right. You said that Savile had multiple levels of access to the royal family. Yes, he did. I read Diana's book. Have you read Diana's book in her own words? And she says that he was creepy. He was brought in to mediate our marriage guidance problems, it's basically. It's extraordinary. Who gets to do that? I mean, he's a, he was a working class northern DJ. How many working class northern DJs get brought in to be a, a marriage guidance counsellor between the next king and his, his wife? It's unheard of. Well, exactly. And, and why was... Savile also sent off to talk with Israel in very, you know, top ranking talks to do with our government. He was a DJ. So what was Savile's real relationship with the royal family? I mean, I, I this I tend to agree with David Icon, and I've talked with David extensively about this. Um, and I do believe that Savile was a procurer of children. I think that was very much his role. If you actually look back at old footage, he's not hiding anything. He's literally, he was literally in plain sight. He's very clear. Is, have you seen the video on YouTube where he's on top of the pops and he just puts his hand up oh, and up a girl's skirt? Oh, there's so many things. There's so many things. But, you know, and the thing is, is that parents were allowing it because as we've seen with like the whole, you know, Michael Jackson situation, parents get completely overwhelmed by stardom and everything. So I think that, I think Savile was a paedophile, obviously, and an abuser. Although there are people who will tell you he absolutely wasn't and they will fight tooth and nail that he was 
a scapegoat. Um, but I think that his job, he, he had too much access in parliament, um, parliament and royals. If you can walk into Buckingham Palace and you can just take in a, a child that you want to film and you just go to, you know, which he does, which I mentioned in the documentary. And he like sees, and I don't know if you remember that clip, but it's very dodgy because he says to when he realizes that he's saying something a bit too open on a chat show, he starts to try and turn it into a, a joke and he double he, he doubles back, he comes back and he, he he squashes his words. But what he's actually saying is that Prince Philip says, you know, put the kid away. That's what he says Prince Philip says. What? What? Didn't he just go up to someone what was it what was it he did when he went into the palace was that to Prince Philip or was that to the, the secret Psst. service you, you know he did that to Prince Philip Psst. Psst. like you know like he was giving him orders L and but furthermore what it also said to me was that wasn't the first time that, that Savile had brought in a child to the palace because if he's going Psst, to Prince Philip Right, you can go into the bow room. I don't know if you've ever been in Buckingham Palace, right? <laughs> Nobody can just access the bow room. That's not how it works. He walked, he took a child who had not been given palace clearance into the palace, which he said was for Jim will fix it, which he suddenly decided on the hoof to do. Yeah, of course you do, because that's that's how TV programming works. Um, and he just took this child straight in and psst, uh, Prince Philip and put the kid away. What? What does all that mean? And my, it was Michael Parkinson, I think, who was yeah. the chat show. Why wasn't he asking questions about that? Why wasn't he asking Savile, why have you got so much access to Parliament? They're all just smiling. Well, of course, because they're all compliant. Michael Parkinson had a, you know, a, a, a uh, prime show on the BBC. BBC has to this day still to clean up its own house. So... They're all complicit. So, you know, they weren't going to expose it. So if that is correct, what David Icke said, that Savile was a procurer yeah. to wealthy, famous and possibly royals, do you think he was procuring for the royal family, people associated with the royal family? Most definitely. I don't, I don't have a doubt about that at all. And that goes back to what I said to the editor, and that is I don't think the British people are ready to hear about, you know, the, the goings on of the establishment. Because I all I have to do is say on social media, I think we should, you know, uh, abolish royalty and people go insane. You want to tell them that there might have been an issue with Prince Charles's granddad? And children, you want to tell them that? People who is part of their history? Do you know what I'm saying? So who it's was like, Prince Charles's well, granddad Mount, and what was his history Mount of children? Batten, there were a lot of issues around that, you know, the the boat and all of these, you can know, you, different Because just a lot of people watching this are young people, they might not be aware of these yeah, names. Yeah, and... Lord Mountbatten, who was, was he, now was he Charles's granddad or godfather? But he was a, a senior relative to him. Of course, he died under very strange circumstances on a boat but there are very very there's lots of not just rumors coming out now police are talking and saying children were taken onto those boats you know same with edward heath we knew this and then again david ike was on that early and you know uh, uh, it was the same thing you know it was exactly the same thing i met dr joan coleman before she died i don't know if you're familiar with dr joan coleman but from the documentary yeah yeah now it was joan who uh psychiatrist, I believe she was a psychiatrist, not a psychotherapist, she was a psychiatrist. It was Joan who had taken all the early testimonies from children about satanic abuse. It was Joan who was demonized in the 80s um, by journalists and establishment puppets who are still around to this day writing in national newspapers. Um, and I contacted Joan two years ago and I spoke with her partner and she was quite elderly by this point, maybe late 80s 90s or something and I said explained what I wanted to do and he said come come and meet her she'd like to meet you and I went down on a Sunday afternoon in Surrey Hills and sat down and talked with Joan she was having some issues some there were some issues which I don't want to go into in great detail because that's private and and I want to that give her that dignity she died shortly afterwards I will say that but what Joan was able to tell me was astonishing astonishing Joan had a, it was Joan who compiled the Reigns list. Are you familiar with the Reigns list? Let's explain that. The Reigns list is, uh, it's about, it's a list of people, very famous people, people in the media, actors, actresses, politicians, etc., etc., who names who had been given to Joan, who were said to be involved in satanic ritual abuse or the sexual abuse of children. It's an extensive list. Um, I, don't know uh, the veracity of it, but having met Joan, 
I think that she would have compiled it in an extremely forensic manner. And what she told me was that she wasn't prepared to put anybody's name down on that list unless several independent people said the se who didn't know each other said the same thing. What Joan was able to ascertain, which was very scary indeed, and in fact, it still makes me feel shivery to even recall it, was at least five of her children who had been sent to her, claiming to have been involved in some sort of abuse, had traumas, they named Edward Heath. But they said something really curious about Edward Heath. Um, and none of them knew each other. And that's why I believe what she had to say. And what these children said was that when Edward Heath abused them, he used what was like a mechanical hand because he couldn't bear to touch them with his own hands. Now, five children said that independently. What are the chances? You see, that's how, and that, I believe, formed a huge part of um, the, uh, what was it, operation that Mike Veal was doing for Wiltshire Police operation but it was the edward heath um police investigation i think that formed conifer that's it with mike veal and i think that formed a huge part of those revelations the fact they were independent witnesses that 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 convinced wiltshire police there was something worth pursuing so yeah so but joan was brilliant and joan had talked to a lot of people and she was very very clear that the issue of child abuse and ritualistic child abuse went from the upper echelons of society to the lower and she was convinced that the royals were included in that upper echelon yes what um, basis did you have for that? Well, again, the same thing. Children telling her that at these uh, country houses that they were taken to. I mean, a very interesting thing that she said to me. And again, from a journalistic perspective, I found this very interesting. It's not good enough. I won't be tarring anybody. You know, I, as I said to you, being accused of being a paedophile or a child abuser is a horrendous thing. And it, it, it's a, it, it makes your life dangerous. So you have to be careful, which is why some people say to me, why haven't you named him? Why haven't you named him? Well, because I haven't got the information to go forward. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to name only people who I truly believe I've gathered enough evidence on. And one of the things that Joan said about Edward Heath that again convinced me, I know that it's, you know, I mean, they did say, even though they closed the inquiry they did say there were at least six or seven you know people who had very valid testimonies and you know were, were he still alive he'd be he'd be hauled in but of course look look how the establishment rallied around in there petrified of, of you know great heath um but what joan said was really interesting was that and this is how she met her partner was that her partner's sister had been involved in ritualistic abuse and had been abused by Edward Heath, claimed to have been abused by Edward Heath. And she said to Joan, I can even take you to where the house is. And they drove from Surrey to Wiltshire. They went down lanes and lanes and lanes. This child was able to show them a back entrance. She described in perfect detail how you access the back area. She showed them the steps walking down. She told them about how her and children gathered there by their fathers, oftentimes in Masonic rituals, how her and other children had been taken to the basement and one child had escaped and they had released the dogs on the child and the, the dogs had savaged and murdered the child in front of the other children as a warning not to try and escape again. And Joan told me that and this child had taken them to the, and this child, in the dead of night, this child knew every part of that estate, right? She had nothing to do with it. And it was an estate that Edward Heath used in Wiltshire. Um, so there's a lot of information behind this. This is not just saying somebody looks a bit dodgy, I think they're a pedo. This is a lot of information that we've been gathering over a period of years. So the contemporary royal story then is Epstein and Prince Andrew. Prince Andrew's now hired a PR guru, the master of the dark arts, Mr. Steen, I think his name is. Um, he said that in recent weeks that Andrew flew out to visit Epstein because he wanted to break up their relationship. I saw that. I saw that. Because, of course, that's what you do. Um, look, I was told something a very long time ago about Epstein, and it still stands because I've heard a lawyer come out with it recently. And that was, if you were around Epstein, you knew he liked little girls. Right? I was told that a very long time ago. And you only have to look at Epstein's little black book, which is quite outdated now, obviously. But you see the names in there. It's astonishing. Prince Andrew 
has a case to answer. There is no doubt about it. I mean, they're even saying, oh, that's a doctored picture. That wasn't him. He wasn't there. Of course, because this is what the establishment does. It, the, the establish and don't anybody tell me that that man committed suicide because that is ludicrous. It is ludicrous. The whole, he was on suicide watch and then it was removed. What? I mean, this is a man who could take down, you know, serving presidents, you know, past and present, it, you know, so they had to get rid of him. They had to get rid of him. Yeah, the two guards fell asleep simultaneously. I know, which isn't has never it extraordinary? In the history of that I know, jail. but with a, such a high profile person as well. None of the camera well. footage is available. No, I know. So regarding the, the they said that the picture of uh, Andrew in front of the white banister was doctored. Yeah. That was the first accusation. And they said that the picture in the park was doctored. That's been in the news in recent days. Yeah. So me and James here went to Ghislaine Maxwell's house in London and we knocked on the door and we rang the bell and we didn't think anyone was going to answer. And we, were, we were actually crossing the street and James goes, the door's opening, the door's opening. So we ran over there. Wow. And James was, was kind of on the wrong side of me to get the banister. So I'm talking to this lady who's answered the door the cleaner and I'm yelling at James get behind me get the banister because the banister was wow. right there in front of it? me yeah wow yeah, we got amazing it. we got it and it's on the channel oh. and if anyone's not seen that yet I'll put the Epstein playlist in the description box below this video we've got 80 plus videos right now on Epstein in that playlist wow <laughs> you've gone into it in I, some think, I think I'm going to write a book on it actually well you should yeah you should it definitely needs to be done no doubt about it I mean look the truth is is that Epstein as far as I was concerned was a higher procurer than Jimmy Savile because we're talking internationally so you've got your own island for goodness sake you know it really quite astonishing what was taking place there but you see this is where I start to get angry because you cannot be this person without lots of people enabling this and they don't have to be paedophiles but as far as I'm concerned if you're a chauffeur if you're a cleaner whoever you are if you are aware that somebody is abusing children then you are complicit simple as I don't want to hear people coming out now going oh we all knew well why didn't you expose that when there was a chance to perhaps save more children so there is complicit same thing with the whole green room talk about Jimmy Savile when Esther Ranson said oh we all heard yeah but why don't you do anything about it though so talking about co-conspirators then mm. there's a guy I've interviewed on this channel his name's John Mark Duggan he was a cop in the Florida Police Department right the lead investigator, Epstein, who died mysteriously around just over 50 years age, knew that his superiors were going to cover this up. So he gave his files to John Mark Duggan. Right. John Mark Duggan was charged with hacking and all this other stuff and he's facing multiple life sentences. America. So he fled to Russia and he's got the tapes. Wow. An author friend of mine, Ron Chepsiuk, was in Russia at the time. So I, you know, he, he went over and, and confirmed and looked at some of the video evidence. Elites in sex parties with uh, underage that Epstein had recorded. So, do you know much about the history of Ghislaine Maxwell and the Maxwell family in terms of blackmailing operations? No, I don't. Other than pretty much what everybody else knows. Look, we know they've been a dodgy family for years. We know that. Look at the whole boat accident and everything. Very, very strange stuff. Look, she seems to have been around all the time. Okay. And these people don't operate in solitary that you know in isolation that's so why she is still sort of free ranging everywhere i have no idea and it she almost certainly knows pretty much everything i would say everything i think she's been involved in it certainly there's accounts that she's been involved in it you know these these people are not like us sean they're not like us they operate on different levels and i wouldn't go so far as to say you know that they're you know Lizards or anything like that. That's not where I'm coming from. But what I am saying is that they do operate on a different level and they do operate on a darker level. And being the daughter of a medium, rest in peace, my dear mum, but I do understand some of that stuff, right? I get that stuff. And I know how people use dark arts um, in, 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 in as manipulation, as, you know, to uh, do all, to cover up all manner of situations. So she has, as far as I'm concerned, she's completely complicit, if not actively involved in the abuse of children. And I have no idea why she's still roaming around. I literally have no well, it idea. It boggles my mind that the whistleblowers are in prison, that, that John Mark there. Duggan is in Russia facing life sentences. Yeah. yeah. But Maxwell and Jean-Luc Brunel 
are out there. There's not even an international arrest warrant, as no. far as I'm aware, at this point. Yeah. So, but that tells you that tells you something. See, the thing is, is that I think people have to realise sometimes we don't need people to actually tell us in black and white the answer. All we have to do is look at the actions. Now, the actions are run it through. No MP has ever been uh, um, arrested or tried for crimes against children. No member of the royal family, even though these rumours have been going on for a long time, and I would say they are far more than rumours. I would say that there is substantial evidence. So the actions are that the establishment, whatever establishment that is, British establishment, American establishment, whatever, will always gather round and protect itself. And Epstein was part of the establishment. He, they, they want to try and deal with him like, like he's a rogue pedo. No, mate, he wasn't. Trust me, he wasn't. So, no, he's very much part of the establishment and they are not protecting him. They had to get rid of him. They are protecting everybody else that he was involved with, which probably includes, well, certainly includes Maxwell because she is still roaming around. It's ridiculous. So multiple girls have said that Andrew did sexual acts with them. Yeah. Um, I got an email last night from a victim who's not been in the media at all. Her name's Jessica. She has put a video on YouTube and I'm hoping to interview her here pretty soon. And she's saying that um, she was trafficked to Andrew as well. So looking at the testimonies of the girls from Royal Palm Beach High School and Virginia Roberts, the original, the one who's been most in the media, um, so she, Virginia said she had sex with Andrew three times. And the third occasion, even though she was 18, it was an orgy with underage girls who'd been procured from Eastern Europe and they could barely even speak English. Mm -hmm. And Epstein was boasting that these are the easiest girls, you know, to, to get in, in, his, in his sick manner. Um, so basically she said that Prince Andrew was in an orgy with her, with, with children. Even with that level of allegation, mm -hmm. do you think nothing will ever happen? to Andrew, do you think the royals are completely untouchable? Pretty much. Isn't that awful? I mean, pretty much. It, uh, it's awful. I mean, I just... This stuff keeps me awake at night. <laughs> the, the sheer injustice of how somebody can steal a bottle of water from Lidl and be banged up for six months, right? And you can go around and you can be raping children and you can be murdering children. And I do believe this has all taken place and nothing is done about it. I do believe that the royals are above the law. Yeah. And Virginia Roberts, in her testimony, the media was saying that she had sex with Clinton. She said she absolutely hadn't. And I think by her saying that, it gives her more credibility Indeed. about what she said about Andrew. I felt that as well. But I've researched, I've written a whole series of books on the war of, on drugs and I've researched Clinton. And I've seen all of the sexual assault cases that were settled with him out of court. Do you know anything about Clinton's history with deviant behavior? Well, it's the same thing, isn't it? What we've always heard. I mean, the whole Monica Lewinsky stuff was scratching the surface. And that was actually used. I mean, certainly my research has been very much that that was actually actively used to make him look like just a bit of a player liked old liked win, like women didn't didn't like children and so that was promoted and pushed to create a certain idea about him that he was a bit of a naughty boy but he would never do anything with children and so i think monica lewinsky and certainly all the research that i've done was that that narrative was pushed because it it created a certain idea about him which took it far away from children and just to be in a womanizer a womanizer is bad enough but People don't penalise you for that. They don't penalise you for that. Certainly not in the polls and certainly not in America. Okay. At, look at Boris Johnson. Um, so they set an idea about Clinton. He was given, you know, a, an absolute public relations makeover to create in him, you know, as I say, a womanizer, a player, anything but a child abuser. It, there, is a, there is a great deal of evidence to suggest, well, we know about his involvement with Epstein. I think that he has been Mr. Teflon for so long. There are a number of them. 
There are a number of them who were like this, but Clinton is abysmal and they've all covered up for him. They've all covered up for him. Don't anybody come to me and say, oh, but Obama was different. No, he wasn't. Obama was no different to any of them. They're all the same. They are all the same. Going back to what you said, I don't believe that you can be a president or a prime minister unless you are prepared to do the um, do whatever it is that the establishment has decided is the narrative. So uh, I I don't believe that non-corrupt people can make those positions. I think you've just put that more succinctly than I've ever heard it. From my own research, my own conclusion, Monica Lewinsky was a bone thrown to the media to make him look like this. Absolutely. Jack the Lad kind of character. Absolutely. And it worked. <laughs> It worked because then we started to hear about his, you know, we'd heard about the relationships, about his, um, you know, what had happened in uh, in Arkansas, about his, you know, it was all about him being just a bad boy. And then don't forget, Hillary then came out and did her big stand by your man thing for TV at the same time. And I believe it was, well, certainly my informers have told me that that was all part of of the public relations, of creating in the public an idea that he was a bit of a wide boy, but nothing more. Well, Hillary, the champion of human Hillary. rights, my research has led me to discover that the people that he slept with, Bill, that he was unfaithful with her or that he sexually assaulted, she tracked all of those people down. Yeah. And they were threatened and there was animals, pets were killed and threats of people, she's women a, getting close. She's a vicious off. bitch. No, <sighs> she's nasty. <laughs> She's, I don't know if I can say that. You can um, say whatever you thank want. Thank you. She's nasty. Well, this will be a little clip. <laughs> but you do know what she did to the 12-year-old girl uh, in, in court where she came... The original paedophile case. Right. Yeah. Can you, can you describe that for us, please? Well, I can't describe it in detail because I don't know it in detail enough. But what I do know was that she was... Uh, and don't forget, there was a lot of stuff around Hillary. Vince Foster, okay, who was almost certainly her lover and he died and all these people just kept dying in very strange anybody who kind of like was around the Clintons at a certain period of time they just kept dying in very strange circumstances and so she was involved in a case in which um, a 12 year old was saying that she had been sexually assaulted she had been raped and abused and everything and Hillary went after her with such venom and she even was was quoted as saying that even even if she believed her, she was going to flatten this once and for all. So this is not somebody who cares about children. She cares about power in much the same way as incredibly wealthy people. They just keep wanting to acquire more money. They, it's power status for them. OK, They're, I mean, I don't know a politician or a president who cares about children. Show me one. I don't know one. There's never been one. Not not to the degree where they will protect them. Look at the stories about Donald Trump that we've heard. You know, testimonies from young women who said, well, he went with me because he said I looked like his daughter. This has happened. This is this is these are testimonies that that people have made, right? So we know that there is a lot of perversion that seems to swamp its way up to the top. And with Hillary, wasn't she cackling that she got that guy off on a technicality? Well, it, and the victim had been so um, sexually damaged that her internal organs were, were something well, was wrong. Exactly, there, exactly. And because you're remembering details that I can't remember, unfortunately, I can only remember so much. There's like, there's only so much information I can remember, but that. All I remember quite clearly was that she was jubilant to have savaged this young girl about something that that girl should have been protected about. You touched on the Clinton body count. I've got a book coming out for Christmas called Clinton, Bush and CIA Conspiracies from the Boys on the Tracks to Jeffrey Epstein. Right. And if anyone's interested in that, by the time this podcast comes out, um, there will be a link below in the description box um, if you want to check that out. But going back to when Clinton was the governor of Arkansas, oh my goodness. I mean, what was going on there? So I wrote a book also about Barry Seal, who was flying the cocaine in for the CIA. Right. And my research has led me to believe that the fact that Clinton provided the state security apparatus, the state police to protect that yeah. operation, which was George H.W. Bush was running it. Right. Bush and Clinton crime families working together. Yeah, yeah. 
He was then given the White House because he was shocked that he was a team player with Bush and the CIA. We shouldn't be shocked if this is the truth. We really shouldn't be shocked. There's nothing. I remember the very famous expression, and that is nothing in politics happens by accident. And that is a reality. You know, this is all very calculated what takes place. You know, the fact that they can bring through entire families to become presidents is extraordinary. So, you know, these people are put in place because they have already proven their worth and they are already also blackmailable. That's important. That's important. They can't have clean hands. Otherwise, what's there to lose? So they've got to have something that makes them blackmailable. And what what security service contacts have told me very clearly is other than drugs, other than uh, bombs and war weaponry, child abuse is the best currency that they've got that they can use against each other. And that is used internationally. Oh, it's absolutely horrendous. So Clinton was um, doing so much cocaine back then. He got hospitalized with septum sept damage or something. And Hillary went down to the hospital, threatened all the staff, if you ever tell anyone about this, you know, your careers are over. Just and then his brother, um, Clinton's brother, got arrested doing a cocaine deal. And he, he's on he's on the record saying some of this is for Bill and who's got a, a nose like a vacuum cleaner. Yeah, yeah, Clinton then went on to lock up a record level of low level drug users for the prison industrial of complex. Of course, though. Of course, though. This is the thing. If we started to look more at what it is that politicians seem to be so passionate about in terms of you know, reinforcing laws or whatever, it invariably supports their peccadillo. Right. So those people who, for example, fought tooth and nail to remove rights from rented properties not to be habitable were Tory landlords. That's one example. We've had draconian laws that have not been updated to protect children. Who is that serving? It's not serving children. So why aren't the lawmakers doing anything to protect children? Because it's not in their interest. And why do we have one focus group after another trying to uh, reduce the age of consent? Because they want men to be able to rape children and not be prosecuted for it. There's a barrister, a fairly well-known barrister, and I'm not going to give her any credit by naming her, but people will probably know her. But she came out and she said quite clearly that the age of consent should be lowered to stop the persecution of old men. Now, if that is a barrister saying it, what do you think the rest of the establishment are thinking? So one of the themes in your documentary, which I found particularly interesting and it's had a big impact on, on my own career because I started out as a, an activist blogger. My, my writing was smuggled out of the jail and exposed what was going on in that jail. Was that historically, the mainstream media's controlled the narrative. Yeah. But now with the rise of the internet, yes. that suppression of these voices is impossible. Could you expand on that point, please? Well, um, that's unfortunately changed slightly since I made the documentary because obviously what we're seeing is YouTube has become scarily uh, censorious. Oh yes, I'm demonetized now and I've been, a lot of my subscribers have just, I'm getting messages every day now from my subscribers saying we've been unsubscribed. Yeah, yeah, that does happen. That will certainly happen with, with but, but generally I am heartened by what we have been able to bring to the surface as a consequence of journalism that takes place on and research that takes place on the internet. And so we've seen that. And of course, narratives are controlled by mainstream media. And I talk as somebody who's worked in mainstream media for 30 years, so I really know what I'm talking about. And some people go, she must be a shill if she can work in mainstream media and talk about paedophiles. Yeah, well, guess what? I get booted off, you know, television shows <sighs> constantly. But, you know, I we are in broadcasting. There is a such a thing as um, there is a, a, an audience expectation. So if you expect from a certain person that they may well have a certain line, Ofcom is okay with that. So for example, you wouldn't expect me to go, vaccinate all your children, kids, because that wouldn't necessarily, well, definitely not where I'm coming from. But um, it, so there's an audience expectation that I wouldn't say that. So you are allowed to sort of get away with stuff like that. So there's certain things that I can get away with in mainstream media because I have carved a reputation for being somebody who fights against the establishment. So I'm allowed to do it. I'm allowed to do it, but I still get in trouble. I still get in terrible trouble. I, you know, get booted off TV all the time. The McCann story nearly killed my career, you know, pursuing that. So, 
you know, there are some stories which are very, very dangerous for journalists to get involved in. And McCann's story was one of them. Are you saying then that the mainstream media, to give the appearance of a healthy debate, will allow people on who are more radical, but only allow them to go to a certain line? Absolutely. I mean, Noam Chomsky summed it up beautifully. I mean, I'm going to have to paraphrase him very badly, but what he said was that in order to give the appearance of healthy debate is you do exactly that. And that is you allow what appears to be a series of mixed opinions, but they're all going around in the same circle. I occasionally break through that circle. I got into trouble in uh, May this year on This Morning. I was asked to go on and talk about uh, Marks and Spencer Pride sandwiches. Now, I've spent this year making a documentary about the whole issue of gender and how it impacts people. So I knew rather a lot on that subject and I knew what was going on. Anyway, to cut a very long story short, I completely trashed the brief and I just said exactly what I wanted. I got in trouble. They docked my pay and I haven't been back on there since. But I don't care because... The one thing that I wanted to do, set out to do, was I wanted people to Google a thing called Cotton Ceiling, which is actually about the rape of lesbians by transsexual women, which is being pushed by Stonewall, the main group that are saying that lesbians should be sleeping with people who are same gender. Well, people with same gender have penises. Lesbians are attracted to people who are same sex. So that's rape. It's rape culture. And I said all this, I completely, I said, I've had enough of sandwiches. I want to talk about rape culture that's going on, what Pride are doing. So I kept, I, I talked about the companies that we were there to talk about, but I talked about things that nobody wanted to talk about. And everybody was very, very concerned. I got into trouble, but I said to the audience, please Google cotton ceiling. And that day, Google see cotton ceiling went to the top of Google mm. charts. So I don't care. I don't care because I will always find a way to get my voice heard, even if I get removed from every damn show. So yes, there is a, there's, there's a, a circle of expected opinion. That's why you get people like Owen Jones. They're all very much establishment journos. I don't know if you know him, but he's establishment journos. And they get to be on BBC a lot, obviously, because they've been vetted and BBC vet people. They still vet people. They vetted people for a long time. MI5 vetted people. That has already been proven 20 years ago. That is still happening. It is 100% still happening because it's the same establishment voices that get onto the BBC. So I was just interviewed by RT. They came to one of my school's talks, actually. Do you think that if you got excommunicated by all of the mainstream UK channels, you said you could still get your voice out? Are you talking about channels like RT and the internet? I work on RT. I work on RT, yes. And also because um, I've got some financial backing, some independent financial backing from an ethical couple um, and uh, they have been supporting me to make independent films this year and to to make this documentary. I'll always find a way. I'll always find a way because I believe in the power of truth. See, go back to what you said at the beginning and that is I don't feel the need to jazz anything up because the truth itself is really alarming, really alarming what's happening with our with children and has been happening for a long time and people who would be in silence, right? So I don't need feel the need to create anything spectacular, you know, about rituals that I don't know about or anything. I talk only about the stuff that I know about and that I have thorough and I also go to first sources. I'm a lot of people use second, third, fifteenth source and go, oh that happened. No, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. So I always go to first source as much as I can, as much as I humanly can. Um but, uh, you know, we are at a place where the internet proved too powerful, right? The voices that were emerging on the internet was proving too powerful. The fact that when you go on YouTube now and you put in 9-11, only two years ago, if I put in 9-11, I'd get a bunch of alternative media about 9-11. That is not what you get now. OK, on my two Madeleine McCann documentaries, which are on YouTube, they have attached a Wikipedia to it to explain the official narrative of Madeleine McCann's disappearance. Right. So we are talking about they, they sanitize as much as they can. But like I say, I believe in the power of the truth. So one way or another, I will always get out what needs to be said. That boggles my mind because I've looked, tried to look at everything you've got online and I've put your name in into, into YouTube and I, your Madeleine McCann stuff hasn't even come up for me. See, and I mean, we're talking that. Both documentaries have half a million views, you see. So you have to know it to find it. So they do all this shadow banning and all this stuff that goes on. But yeah, eventually, the cream always rises to the top. And when I say cream, I talk, I mean truth, right? Eventually, I believe it always rises to the top. The Madeleine McCann documentaries, again, that is about complicity of, 
you know, international forces of government. You know, there's suggestions of child sex well, abuse. Let's, there. let's go over this a bit more All slowly because right. this is one of the biggest I'm so, stories. I'm that so I want sorry, to talk people about. listening. I do tend to talk quite fast. And we, we've got we've got all the time in the world to expand on it. So, oh my goodness, this story. I've watched one of the documentaries on Netflix, and when I watched that documentary, oh. then I was convinced that the parents weren't in on it. And then I've had guests come on, and I've spoken to other people. The next thing, I'm convinced that the parents are in on it. So my brain is like going like this, like this, lurching this way, lurching that way. I have nowhere near the credentials you have on this subject. Could you just, for young people watching this who aren't even familiar with the story, could you just give a, give a summary of the story and then give give your expert opinion? Okay, well, I've been to the scene of crime twice uh, in Prada de Luz, Portugal. Madeleine McCann was um, uh, just days away from her fourth birthday when she was reported, I always say reported missing. I never say disappeared, right? I always say reported missing because that's accurate. She was reported missing on May the 3rd, 2007. We don't know if she actually went on May the 3rd, 2007. So I think it's important to, I think words are important. So reported missing is accurate. Nobody can disagree with that. So she was reported missing on May the 3rd, 2007, while her parents, Kate and Jerry McCann, were at the tapas bar, uh, just adjacent, the, the apartment, Apartments here is far too far to leave three children with a collective age of under seven in one apartment alone. But that was their story. Of course, many people will say they were never left alone and they had to create the alibi of being left alone. Otherwise, there could be no abduction. So that's what many people say. Um, but so the, the, the situation was that Madeline was apparently snatched uh, sometime between 9.12 and 10 o'clock on May the 3rd, 2007, while her parents were at this tapas bar. Now, they were at this tapas bar. I mean, I've, I spent two years reading the police files. As I say, I've been to the scene of crime. I've talked to police. I've got documentation from Portuguese police. What we are dealing with is mass corruption. Um, Kate and Jerry McCann were very useful and they were used by the Labour government. Tony Blair at the time was prime minister. Six months before... Madeline went missing. He was at the Forensic Service Laboratory, which was attached to the Home Office. It no longer exists. And he, and you can find this online, you can verify this online, and he made a public declaration that he wanted to work with the Forensic Science Service so that from this point onwards, what we would gather, what we would collect was not just the DNA of criminals, but everybody so that everybody in Europe. That's what Tony Blair wanted. Right. And he made that promise in a photo call at the Forensic Science Service six months before Madeline went missing. Come up to where Madeline's gone missing. We're talking within hours. There was political intervention. Right. The literally political intervention. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is they um, you had the um, the ambassador to Portugal immediately on the scene. Um, Jerry McCann received a, a personal phone call from Gordon Brown. I mean, who does that? And at that time, he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. He was just a month away from becoming Prime Minister. I think that that uh, the Labour Party wanted to use the McCanns for a number of reasons, and they went on to use them. One of them was they wanted to have this situation where everybody had their DNA tested in um, in Europe. And one of the first things that Kate and Jerry McCann said was, if Portugal had proper DNA testing our daughter might have been found by now. And they made a big thing about that. So then Kate and Jerry McCann were given jobs as like ambassadors to go around the European Parliament and plead for the extension of the Amber Alert, which would create more people having DNAs, not just criminals, everybody, which is completely wrong, obviously. And they said it's about cross-border cooperation. Kate and Jerry McCann managed to get the Amber Alert extended, but they didn't manage to get the full DNA checks done. Um, but Labour used them for a number of reasons because they thought they're a nice middle class family. They'll work well for us. Gordon Brown had always been known as the money man who was a bit hostile and a bit too scientific. It worked well for him to be seen as somebody who was looking for a missing child. And isn't she so blonde and so pretty? And no disrespect to Madeline ever, but they used her. They used her. So where we are now is we now have a police um, operation Grange, which has been going since it was, uh, it started off in 2013, 2012, 2013. And it was originally supposed to be a review of the Portuguese police files. And of course, we completely demonized the Portuguese police and Gonzalo Amaral. It was outrageous that we did. And we did that simply because they were not having it. Right from the get-go, they knew something was wrong. Anybody who spent 
serious time looking into the case. If they conclude anything other than Madeline never left that apartment, then they haven't looked into that the case properly. I believe Madeline never left that apartment. Alive, should I say. There was cadaver spats. There was blood spats that the dogs detected. Okay. Excuse me, my stomach's rumbling. I hope you can't hear this. Um, all of this that was picked up, that was rubbish, that was lost. The, uh, the DNA was sent to uh, laboratories that managed to lose it, managed to destroy the samples, all mad stuff. Dr. Mark Perlin has recently come out and said, with the remaining samples, I can give you a profile of who died in that apartment because nobody died prior to Madeline. You know, you're only gonna get cadaver if somebody's died, right? And that was behind the sofa. One theory is that they did leave the children and when they were coming in and out during the night, they had medicated the children. Don't forget, Kate was an anaesthetist and the rumour was very much that they had medicated the children to keep them asleep while they were out partying. And they had medicated them but hadn't medicated them enough. And so the, the theory is that when Jerry or Matthew or whichever one of the... And don't forget, out of the nine people who were there, six of them were doctors. What on earth they all doing leaving toddlers alone? I mean, they at the very least, they should have been done for child neglect. They all fell within the boundaries of child neglect. It was disgusting. But anyway, so it's highly likely likely that what happened was when somebody came in to check them, Madeline woke up, semi woke up, and th there was a sofa by a window which looked out where Jerry was talking when he exited the apartment to a TV producer who was also on holiday at that time, which as an aside is also very interesting because when you look at the guest list of people who were staying in the Ocean Club during that week, it's very, very interesting. Relatives of Margaret Hodge, city people. I mean, we're talking about a little Portuguese village, which is a bit like Margate. It's not really somewhere where elitist kind of people go for holidays, right? So what were they all doing there at the same week anyway? So that's a whole other story. So it's highly possible that Madeline may have fallen down the back of the sofa and that may be where she died because there was blood and there was cadaver and the two dogs. And we're not talking about regular dogs. We're talking about Eddie and Keela, who were top of the range dogs with Martin Grime from North Yorkshire Police. And these dogs had a 100% track record. But suddenly, and, and bear in mind, they only searched the McCann's apartment, all of their holiday friends, and the McCann's new apartment that they moved into after Madeline went missing. And the dogs only alerted in the in the apartment where the child went missing and the McCann's new apartment. So as well as the car, of course, as well, but not in their friends' apartments. This, 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 people not find this a bit coincidental. I mean, I don't know. Do people not? So the Madeline McCann story has driven me mad from the beginning. I never believed it from the beginning. I was I mean, I can't even tell you how many editors told me don't be so heartless as poor parents. They wouldn't say the same if it was a single black parent living in a tower block who had gone out on jollies and left to their child alone, they would not be saying the same thing. And that shows the snobbery. Um, but it also what I realised was that a lot of my colleagues in media were also going on holidays and leaving their children as well. So that's why they felt sympathy with the McCanns as well. Just to bring it up to bang up to date. So we've got Operation Grange, which they say they spent 12 million on, close to 14 million. Um, they've now currently got four to fit five officers working on it. Um, some people believe that the aim is that they're working on a, a case to firm up and bring in the Tapas 9. I doubt it. Not now. I think it's all gone too far. Um, but uh, at the very least, I truly believe, and I'm very careful in the documentaries not to accuse anybody of anything. I simply show the facts. The facts of, for example, the McCann's change, changing their statements about how they accessed the apartment because they couldn't remember whether they came in through the side door or whether they came in through the front door. All of this really odd stuff, right? There was lots of stuff that got changed that didn't make any sense. I mean, I've read their police statements. I mean, you know, dodgy. Everything's dodgy. But at the very least, I truly believe that Kate and Jerry McCann know what happened to Madeline. At the very least. What about the theory that was put forth in the Netflix doc that I watched that a stranger mm. had been scoping them out and he snatched... Madeline, and he was a procurer for a uh, European paedophile ring. Lie. Rubbish. First of all, the Netflix doc is awful. 
It's awful. It features at least six people who have been on the McCann's payroll at some stage or another or have financed the McCann's, whether that's their PRs or the people who have paid for their legals or the police who, like Jim Gamble, who was a very senior cop in Northern Ireland, who I had a very very serious set to over this. No fan of Jim Gamble. He's been heavily promoting this case from the get-go, the abduction theory. I've worked with Colin Sutton. Colin Sutton is a, an excellent cop. He was involved with the Amelie de la Grande and um, the, uh, the young girl who went missing in Walton. Um, there was a, a ITV documentary about it recently. Um, very famous... Yes, Millie Dowler, Millie Dowler. Colin Sutton was the detective and Colin appears in my McCann documentaries. And the reason that Colin appears is because um, Colin was a very high, you know, senior cop, senior detective. And it was rumoured in the News of the World that he was going to get the job of the Madeleine McCann investigation. And he and he says on in the documentary, he was called that day or days thereafter by a senior cop from the Met Metropolitan Police and said, don't do it. You won't be able to go where you want to. And I said to him, what do you do? What did you mean by that? And he said, well, that I wouldn't be able to question the parents or go to any of the parents. So that was a senior cop in the Met telling me that. And he's not alone. I have been given access to online secret police groups where they talk about things. And those things boggle your minds, what the cops really believe and what obviously they have to do their job. But one cop came out in this secret group, and this will tell you the, the fear that exists around it, which is quite similar to other situations. One cop came out in this group and he said, look, I'm in no doubt, Kate and Jeremy McCann did this, blah, 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 blah. And another one said, you are a senior cop in the Metropolitan Police. I am reporting you tomorrow. And this is in a private group. So that's the level of fear that goes on around this situation. So that's why a lot there's a lot of sec secrecy about it. But we're completely complicit. Operation Grange started, Kate and Jeremy Cam wanted Operation Grange because they wanted to clear their name because the Portuguese, despite what everybody thinks, Portuguese police have never cleared Kate and Jeremy McCann. They, they archived it, but it actually the investigation is up and running again now in Portugal and has been for several years. But Kate and Jeremy McCann have never been cleared of any involvement in their daughter's death. But you wouldn't know that from the British press. So that's why I felt the need to do it. And like anything, I mean, I'm driven very much by making sure I, I hate in any injustices, especially to do with children. And probably that's my own personal issues going on. But but a lot of it is because I they're just innocent. So but what I will say about Madeline, which links us to the whole issue of paedophiles, is I don't uh, other than that theory of her perhaps falling off the sofa, there is the other thing. And that is several days after Madeline disappeared, uh, two doctors gave a statement to Leicester Police called the Gaspers. And I don't know if you're familiar with this story. Well, this is a story that really needs to go wide. These are doctors. And they gave a very serious, both of them gave statements to Leicester Police that they had been on holiday with the McCanns two years before. I think it was in Morocco uh, or Mallorca. Was, but anyway, it was an M place. But anyway, but and also it's interesting. They all like to go a lot away a lot together in big groups right they're little doctor friends so uh, they might be mates they might that's how they might do it who knows but that's what they do this couple Katerina and Aral Gasper went on holiday with them two years before and that included Jerry McCann was there and Dr David Payne who was also on the holiday when Madeline went missing and the Gaspers said quite clearly Katerina Gasper said that one stage, she, on this holiday, she'd been sat in the middle of Jerry McCann and Dr. David Payne, and she believed they were talking about Madeline, and I, I apologise for what I'm about to do, but I, I, things like this, I think people need to be graphic. I don't think you can hold back, and you can find this is a Gasper statement. I believe it's still online, and if not, I'll find a copy of it and I'll put it online. And Katerina Gasper said that she sat in the middle of... of David Payne and Jerry McCann, and she believed they were talking about Madeline, and they said, yes, yeah, she likes that. And put, one of them put his finger in and out of his mouth, and he circled his nipple. David Payne talking to Jerry McCann, talking about Madeline. And then she said it happened a second time when they returned from holiday, and this time she believed that David Payne was talking about his two-year-old daughter. She likes this, finger in and out of her mouth, circling nipple. Who does that? Who does that? 
These are the Gasper statements. Leicester police sat on those from May when Madeline went, and bear in mind, Kate and Joe McCann were saying, she's been taken by a predator, a paedophile, they said that. Leicester police sat on those police statements from two doctors. So that's not the milkman. These are doctors who've been on holiday with them. And it's, not, it's no disrespect to a milkman. What I'm saying is these are peers. These are the McCann's peers. And they went on holiday and Leicester police did not send that to Portuguese police, the Gasper statements, until Gonzalo Amaral was removed from his place in October of that year. Right. So that's June, July, August, 10, five months to send such statements when the, the, the cop who already said something's wrong here with these parents has been removed, which incidentally Gordon Brown knew he was going to be removed before even Gonzalo Amaral did, right? So we are talking about, you know, these people, whatever it is, paedophiles in parliament, Madeleine McCann, these are international cover-ups that are taking place and children are at the heart of it. So, some footage that I've got, which I won't be able to release until after the um, investigations are through. Um, I've been to their homes. I've doorstepped pretty much everybody. I, 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 it's just the way it has to be. That's what journalism is. I'm sorry, that's what journalism is. I was just ask a few questions, if I may, for the camera. No, 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 no. None at all? No. I just wondered what you thought about the current austerity plan that we're going through in this country. I did. I don't think that might be terribly interesting. You don't think so? But you're a lost yeah. child. I don't think right. you have knowledge of such <laughs> things, such as finances. Next time. New World Order, Mr. Rothschild. Right. New World Order. Depopulation. Oh, l listen, who, who are you... Genocide. Who, who are you televising for? Well, we are, we're independent yeah. okay. filmmakers. But you have nothing to say, Mr. Rothschild. Have a nice life, sir. Have a nice death. Well done. Kate and Joe McCann get to go on morning TV and, you know, sit surrounded by people who fawn all over them. Now, I believe they have very serious questions to answer and they were set up to be public figures. She became a, a spokesperson for missing people. The irony, you go on holiday with three children, come back with two and you get a place on missing people. And he became a spokesperson for Hacked Off. Well, Hacked Off want to silence the press. And the story of Brenda, I mean, there's so much to tell you, but in the second documentary that I made, which is called um, Public Relations and Saving Reputations, and it talks about how the McCanns took the money that was given to Madeline's fund, um, which was approximately £4 million. Pound, and that was from... That was from pensioners, children raiding their money boxes. We saw kids all around the country running, you know, dances and fates and everything to raise money for Madeline. They used money for their mortgage. They used, in the first year alone, um, a minimum of £500,000 for their public, they hired public relations companies. They hired reputational management. Since when do parents of missing children need reputational management? Right. So there's something really wrong there. There's something really wrong there. And they Kate refused to cooperate with the Portuguese police. She did not answer the questions. I'm a mother. And, and the thing I think that really triggered me from the get go was the fact that Kate didn't look for Madeline. I found that extraordinary because I'm a mother. I would tear the sand from the beach if my child was missing. She did not look. They claimed that she went out once and looked. And when she was asked about it in an interview, she said, yeah, but we've been so busy. You, There's only one job, mate. Find your daughter. They were so busy setting up funds. They had trademarked Madeline's name within that same month, right? There's only so much that you need to do when you've got a missing child and it doesn't involve setting up legal funds or any of those kind of things. It involves finding your daughter and the only reason you wouldn't look for your daughter is if you already knew what had happened to her. One of the sad parts about the documentary was the investigators found a paedophile ring across Europe right. that, that was circulating photographs. Right. So there was these hundreds of kids who'd gone missing and then they found these photos and they knew who the parents were of some of them. And they had to take tell the parents, look, here's where we found your kids photo on this paedophile ring across Europe. Yeah, that really terrible. broke my heart to see that bit. Well, that is terrible. That, that was just horrendous, absolutely horrendous. Um, you know, and but the protection of children is so low. I mean, 
we all get we all get emotional and we all go, oh, we must protect children and everything. Yeah, but that isn't what's happening. Nobody's protecting children. Children in care homes are still being used as a pipeline to paedophiles and abuse. We know that, right? The easiest way to to have a compliant child is to take them from a home that is already disordered. Right. And I speak as somebody who comes from a disordered home and I adore my family and, I, you know, I'd fight tooth and nail for them. But it was still a disordered home and I know how vulnerable it was. And these children are, you know, trafficked horrendously so. So the Madeleine McCann story is, is not a niche story. It impacts on so many areas. It impacts on our freedom of speech. It, you know, I don't like being gaslighted. I don't like people gaslighting me. When I know something's true and you're telling me it's not, that does my head in. That's what I say when I say this stuff keeps me awake at night is I can't bear mass, you know, delusions. I can't bear that. So, you know, but rest in peace, Madeline. I don't believe she's still alive. Bless her. Um, but whether we will ever find out the truth of what happened is a whole other story. So what you're saying confirms what John Wedger said. We had him on the podcast a few months ago. He was an ex-detective over 20 years and he was assigned to vice and he would like watch the prostitutes and he wasn't just out to arrest them and incarcerate them. He wanted to get a full understanding of what was yeah. going on the street level. Yeah. Then he noticed there was kids out. Yeah, that's right. I met John. I met John before he came out. I met him in a pub in Lewisham with Bill Maloney and we were trying to work out what, you know, might be possible. It was a long time ago, about five, six years ago before he came out. So I know I was aware of... Yeah, he was seeing they were they were covering up stuff in Vice. They were they were trying to move him along, weren't they? They were saying, "Look at this, don't look at this." He said he learned that the kids were coming from the foster homes, like you just said. Yeah, and so the foster homes were just making massive amounts of money to house them. Yeah, foster homes were either complicit in pimping them out, or they just didn't care. They just ran off on the weekends and got high, right, and drunk because they were dealing with this childhood trauma that they hadn't fully addressed, right. And then they were in the, in the prostitution racket getting trafficked. So the older prostitutes were kind of helping John and giving him information to try and get these kids off the street sure. to protect them. Yeah. But then when John figured out that the clients of the prostitutes were TV stars, yeah. politicians, yeah. orders from the top would come down every time to close down the investigations. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in paedophiles in Parliament, I have Dave Eden, who was uh, who was there on the night when they covered up the death of uh, Trevor Lloyd Hughes, who was uh, who had already been pretty much seen as somebody who was involved in the rent boy racket out of Piccadilly Circus that was supplying to politicians. And you know, his death was fake. They said he had had a heart attack, but he was surrounded by you know um, vials of you know poppers, which probably had brought on a heart attack, but. They covered it up. I mean, the, so, and he was somebody who was seen very highly in the police. He was running um, Metropolitan Police football. Um, he was highly decorated. And yet he was running, you know, those poor, impoverished boys out of the wimpy window in Piccadilly. I mean, I used to work down there. That was in the 80s. I used to... I, I moved to London from Gloucestershire where I was born and I used to work in the Empire in Leicester Square in the 80s um, on the door. And uh, we, we used to talk to the boys who were being pimped out and they were just broken. And there's so many boys who are still missing who went through that and God knows what happened to them. But I am in no doubt whatsoever that the police had to have been involved. Well, the police were involved. I know they were involved. Um, and they were involved in, again, maintaining that air of decency for the British establishment because it benefits them all. It benefits them all, but it doesn't benefit you and I. If you've not watched John Wedge's interview with us yet, the, in the link in the description box for this video is the podcast. We've also now got a playlist of ex-cop interviews. We've had Maggie Oliver on. We've had Neil Woods on War on Drugs, Maggie Oliver Grooming Gangs. They all tie in to what we're discussing here today. So going back to paedophiles in Parliament then, Esther Baker and Hemming, we've not discussed them yet, have okay, we? Okay, all right. What, can, you, can you describe about them, please? Well, what I can say to you is um, Esther Baker came out several years ago. I think her first interview was with Sky News. I no Esther, I've talked to Esther several times. Um, and she came out and she was saying that she had been abused as a child in uh, at Cannock Chase. And she said it was an MP and she never named the MP. She never said the MP. It was actually John Hemming who outed himself um, on his own blog. 
Um, and John Hemming was the first person to threaten me with legal action for when I released paedophiles in Parliament um, and said he need, it needs to be removed that day. Otherwise, and he's very au fait with legal, with legalese. I think he has a legal background. Um, and uh, I think that it, to me, it is, I, I'm not making any accusations about John Hemming, but it is quite clear that Esther Baker um, feels that she has a case that needs to be examined, appropriately examined. And what I have seen with Esther is Esther has been savaged by some of the most awful trolls online. Now, the, some of them cross over with my stalkers. They are, some of them are my stalkers, same stalk, people who stalk me. And in fact, Esther and I had a case against the same stalker at the same time and it was thrown out at the same time. So if you can imagine how she felt as somebody who is, I'm saying alleging, alleging that she is a victim of child abuse at the hands of a of a politician. So imagine how she felt to be told that not only is the case not going through for your stalker, but he's given a core participant role on the child abuse inquiry. Pretty awful stuff, really. So I don't know the truth of the story. What I do know is that... Um, John Hemming is extremely proactive at any suggestion of anything to do with reputation. I don't have a problem with that either because I'm extremely proactive about my reputation because my reputation is important to me. So I don't have a problem with that. What I had a problem with was the way that he approached me and was basically insisting that I remove it like there and then as if I'm just going to do it at, at your behest. You've got to be crazy, mate. So I didn't. And I withstood the pressure and the uh, threats of what would happen. And uh, nothing has happened since. So, yeah. So did he actually take any court action with you? Or did he try and get YouTube to do a, like a strike against the those documentaries? Well, I don't know if he tried to get a strike. I don't know that. But he approached me directly and said that uh, what I'd said was wrong. It was uh, damning. And he was going to take legal action unless I removed it there. And then I was like, no. No, I'm not because I don't. I'm not accusing him of anything in it. I am telling the story. We are allowed to tell stories. I'm a journalist. My job is to report what other people are saying. It isn't to furnish opinion. That's when I have an opinion role. But my job as a journalist is to report the story. And he had a problem with me just reporting the story, which I thought was quite interesting, given that he had outed himself. She'd never outed him. He'd outed himself. Did you have any other legal action from any other quarters? Um, I have threats almost uh, on a regular basis. Um, I have been, well, let me see, I've fallen foul of uh, the McCann several times, as everybody does. Uh, everybody does who speaks out. And uh, I've their spokesman, Clarence Mitchell, went into a newspaper and called me a conspiracy theorist, which was absolutely designed to just say ignore her you you know as soon as you start saying that person dabbles in conspiracies we know what it's about it's they might as well have just said she's you know she's got mental health problems it would have had the same impact so i've had that kind of stuff where where people use their establishment contacts to demonize me to smear me to try and make me lose work but still i write just adds more credibility. To well, the thing is, honestly, you know, and I said this to you too earlier, and that is my attitude very much is we're all going to die. So I'd rather go down in a hail of bullets than on my knees. <laughs> That's really the bottom line, right? Because I'm not going to submit to anybody, <laughs> right? But... I, I, if that's the way it has to be, that's the way it has to be. You know, the personification of a spitfire. Good. <laughs> Harvey Proctor. Ooh. What have we got on him? Well, Harvey po Proctor, look, he's just about to sue again, isn't he? Harvey Proctor, let, I mean, when they actually, there was a report about, uh, uh, this is an established report. They found child's belongings with blood in his flat. That never came to the fore during the whole car beach trial, right? Harvey Proctor, we knew now, I fought for LGB rights for many years. So I don't have a problem with Harvey Proctor being gay or the fact that when he was in parliament, it was problematic. There was no doubt about it. They were having to hide their homosexuality, which was completely wrong. And he was doing that. But Harvey Proctor has always somehow managed to like stuff that's been put on him that can be proven and somehow he still manages and so I read today that he's now 
ready to sue again over the whole car beach thing. And it's interesting. These people are so sue happy. They're incredibly sue happy. You know, Harvey Proctor should have been, I mean, he says I, I that, I mean, he's suing the Metropolitan Police because he says that he shouldn't have been ever interviewed. And blah, blah, blah. of course you should be interviewed. If somebody says that you're involved in the gang rape of them and the murder of children, you should be interviewed, right? So he's objecting to this. They, this is what they do. They object to it, you know, in the same way as I didn't agree with what BBC did, but I felt that was a bit of a setup with the whole Cliff Richards thing, you know? I'm, I've never known the BBC to, for example, go and film somebody's house when they're accusing a high profile person like Cliff Richards of being a child abuser and you go and film it. The BBC, that to me felt all very set up as well anyway. So these people are protected and they are protected not just by government institutions, they are protected by our media. That's that's the deal. That's the deal. Harvey Proctor has many questions to answer, but the problem is because of the whole Carl Beach Nick thing now, he won't have to answer any of them. You've brought up the Carl Beach thing several times and I was going to ask yes. you near the end of the interview more about it, but I think we should cover this now because it's been reoccurring. Half my audience are in America. They probably haven't even heard of Carl Beach. Right. A lot of them are young people, teenagers. Could you just give the history of the Carl Beach story? Well, Carl Beach uh, surfaced as somebody called Nick. Um, and he made incredible allegations about how he had, you know, been abused, how he had wit witnessed the murder of children, how this had taken place in a number of locations uh, around the country, including Dolphin Square, um, which is, you know, flats near Parliament where many MPs through decades have had apartments over at Dolphin Square. Um, and one of the uh, people that I spoke to, Peter Bars in Parliament, had actually been taken to Dolphin Square by Trevor, Lo Trevor Lloyd Hughes the cop who his death had been kind of faked. So um, Carl Beach surfaced. I had a problem with Carl's, Carl's well, Nick's prob stories from the beginning because they came through an outfit called um, Exaro. And Exaro surfaced just after the Jimmy Savile, or actually just shortly before the Jimmy Savile revelations. And Exaro's stock in trade was to take people's accounts and publish them all over the place. And they sold uh, their stories to Sunday newspapers and TV and uh, 60 Minutes in Australia. They made a, a lot of money, a lot of money. But it wasn't journalism as we know it. And I had a lot of problems with it because I felt, and I said about it right from the beginning, I said, if you keep putting out stories that are not fact-checked, it means that as soon as one is discredited, that everybody else will be discredited. And I said that 2013. I said it publicly. I said it on TV. I said it on radio. I've said it all over the place. And they kept putting out more and more stories, getting more and more outrageous, not really fact. These, as a journalist, you, look, you can tell me a million things, Sean, but I can't just take your word for it. I have to find out if there's some veracity to it, if it stands up away from you. They didn't do that. They put out somebody's account. Now, talking to, when talking to people who've been abused as children, it's, it's, it's a skill. It requires a skill. Actually, you should be trained to a certain degree to do it because these are very awful, harsh, difficult, painful, uncomfortable memories. It's not about how many, you know, can you say it into my dictaphone and we can quickly flog it to the Sunday Express. And that was what Xaro were doing. And Carl Beach came through Xaro and I knew there was a problem. I knew there was a problem. And I, I said to people from the get-go, out of all the people who are surfacing, he's the one I have the most problem with. And I said it repeatedly because it just wasn't, it wasn't making sense. I'm not saying he's lying. I don't know that. What I'm saying was that he was so easy to discredit because like lots of child abuse victims, he wasn't able to think with clarity. He was over emotional. These are natural attendant behavior patterns of people who have been abused. But the problem is, if you're going at it with just the aim of getting a story out, you're not taking care of how something's said, how much you had to push them to get to that point. And it, it wasn't proper journalism. I think and they were fact feeding him. 
A hundred percent. I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. And I was very public about it and I was very angry about it, about their role. They've now collapsed, of course, but they made a lot of money and they pushed through voices that were highly, highly questionable. So Carl Beach, headline news in the last month, what happened? Well, obviously he was found guilty. Of what? Um, oh, well, actually, I don't know the exact. Uh, well, he was he was found guilty of a number of things. There were He had a number of charges against him. They were also saying that he had child abuse images as well. They were also saying that. Um, but I think he was ultimately found guilty, obviously, of perpetuating a lie that he had been abused. He, of, of Also, I think he was given £20,000 from a victim fund as well, which is what happens. So there were a number of things, number of charges that they got him on. So we had a financial incentive to embellish. He well, you could say that about all of the victims because they created a fund and it was hefty. But I tell you what about that fund, right? That was the company that was given the biggest chunk of that fund was a company that didn't even specialise in child abuse and that was missing people again. So missing people is definitely a charity that should be watched. It's an establishment charity that I believe is used as something of a filter system. And missing people were given, I think it was £175,000 just initially, just to act as some sort of gate, uh, gate uh, service to anybody coming forward. When there was the big publicity drive about, are you a a victim of child abuse come forward and then so the government had a two million pound fund which they gave to different charities and missing people got the biggest chunk even though they had no history of abused children um so do you think there was a convenient timing of this carl beach headline he got almost 20 year prison sentence for alleging these big names were involved in pedophilia this just came out at the time prince andrew it was blowing up in the news about epstein Andrew took off to, I think it was Mallorca with Fergie, his partner in crime, sure. hoping it would die down. Yeah. It escalated. Yeah, and it will. And he hired the new dark, master of the dark arts PR guy. Then all of a sudden, so you've got these allegations that Prince Andrew has done things with kids. Then all of a sudden, the biggest headline in the country is people making allegations about paedophilia have no credibility. Panorama played a blinder. Um, I keep going back to the BBC because I believe that the BBC is an institution that is that has been riddled for decades with child abuse and it has been covered up. I believe that. I believe that people who have... I don't buy a TV licence and haven't for years, but I believe that people who, who, who pay for a, a TV licence have unknowingly um, supported child abuse. Um, and uh, uh, what was the point I was just going to make to you about the BBC? I asked you about the convenience of certain stories. Yes. And in this case... Panorama. They've reduced the credibility of victims. Right, exactly. Well, Panorama did that already. And they already did that. And what Panorama did was that they set out to make a... What was the truth about the... Uh, my documentary was also very much in retaliation to what Panorama had put out as well. Because Panorama went and they tracked down people who had already been discredited in alt alternative media and they deliberately used them knowing full well that they would mm -hmm. then be discredited a second time. Um, and I was in touch with one of the men who has told me for many years that he was abused by Harvey Proctor and Leon Britton. And I, over a period of years, when I keep contact with people who make huge allegations, I test them. When I have regular well, conversations with them, I'll throw something in, just see if they have the same recall. This man has never wavered on what he's had to tell, tell me, never. He was contacted by the producer of Panorama to get involved. They, they rubbished him on Panorama. They didn't give his real name. They just, they rubbished him. They rubbished his claims. But what we discovered was that they, because he showed me all the documentation, the producer only contacted him the afternoon before Panorama was due to go out, right? They gave him no time at all to come back with a response. They completely discredited him, said he you know, was a liar and all these things. They gave him a fake name. And it was the same thing. And I was then told by journalists, by editors after Panorama, that's it. It's done. The story is done now. Panorama has made it quite clear 
These are a lot of, you know, attention seekers coming forward. They've got a financial incentive to do so. You know, they're getting more attention than they probably ever had in their poor lives. And and that then became the narrative thanks to Panorama. So Carl Beach was inevitable. It was inevitable. It's done. The story's done now in the mainstream. The, they will. I don't know an editor, and I have good friends in mainstream. I don't know an editor who will touch a story, and I go to them with good stuff. I, I can I can link them up to people who will you know will take lie detector tests. Will do you know go through it all. Are prepared to be forensically examined, but nobody will listen to them what they have to say. But the media can no longer listen to them. Well, when I say can no longer, has taken an active choice that these people are attention seekers. And they're all of the same caliber of Kyle Beach and should just probably be ignored because they're wasting a lot of money at a time of austerity. So people ask me, why is the media like the Daily Mail and the Sun running with the Epstein story? And my theory is that before the internet, the mainstream had a monopoly on the news, but now they're in competition with independent news reporters. And if they get so far out of touch with what's the biggest trending subjects, they're going to completely lose all the credibility sure. and readership. So to compete with the new media, they've got to run with Epstein. Do you think that's the case? I think to a certain degree, but there's also other things. There's other things operating on mainstream media. I don't necessarily believe that mainstream media is all bought. I don't. I think there are some, some sections of it and certain stories that you can get through. The male, see, I come from the left, right? I'm Labour born and bred, except, oh, never again, but 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 oh, I was. But I've written for the Mail and the Mail on Sunday for 15 years because I see no point in preaching to the converted over at The Guardian, for example, right? You need to get in and you need to talk to people who don't understand about austerity and food banks and all of those things, which is a lot of the stuff that I've written for them. But the Mail and the Mail on Sunday are pretty anti-establishment, actually. People don't realise that. It was the Mail who were prepared to run with all the stuff about common purpose, as one example. You familiar with common purpose? Common purpose. Now, that common purpose links so much of what we're talking about. Common purpose is establishment training, creating future leaders, right? And we have People from the, the best person who ever exposed common purpose was Brian at UK Column. He did a sterling job on common purpose. I, I cannot recommend enough the work that he has done on common purpose. It's brilliant. And it was groundbreaking. And the male realized how good his work was and they picked it up and they actually ran with it. And it sh clearly shows that common purpose, which is a, 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 a which is a grounding, which is um, a training, supplies people throughout the establishment. It's basically like the ma uh, the Masonic equivalent for, well, actually there is no Masonic equivalent because it, it runs alongside it. But common purpose is in education, it's in police, it's in government. They're all these training, all these people who've been trained through common purpose. And they are all part of the same established system about how think these are people who go off to Bilderberg together and travel together and go to all these places together. So, a lot. So the Mail and the Mail on Sunday are actually very good at fighting against the establishment. Well, they're not so good at obviously is 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 fighting against poverty and stuff like that, you know. And they horribly demonise poor people and stuff like that. But fighting against the establishment, the Mail is actually very very. Because I was surprised because Prince Andrew, the royal uh, PR people, had said Andrew categorically denies, <laughs> emphatically denies being aware what Epstein was doing sure. when he was um, back in his house in New York. And then the very next day, after they'd made this big royal announcement, the Mail had the video of Prince Andrew peeping out of the door at these girls, like one of the girls and Epstein's on the street waving to another girl. So who who owns the Mail then? To, to... Well, Lord Rothermere um, owns the Mail, but... Um... Paul Dacre, who was the editor of the Daily Mail up until recently, he hated politicians and wasn't a great fan of royalty either. So he was quite happy to give them a boot. But because male readers are great royalists, he had to do it in a very clever, cunning way. But it, it got done. It got done. And actually, I would just like to, to, to update that because, again, the newspapers that um, are shining at the moment in terms of 
uh, of of revealing what is going on in this new era um, with children are actually the right wing newspapers. The Times, Sunday Times, uh, Mail and the Mail on Sunday are showing what is happening in terms of um, child safeguarding within the system. And I, I'd like to just expand on that a little bit. One of the things that in paedophiles in parliament is about the issue of um, paedophile information exchange, which um, in the 70s and 80s had a huge amount of influence. Um, and they were financed by the Home Office. They did receive some funding. Um, and uh, and there were people like uh, Patricia Hewitt and um, Harriet Harman and her husband, Jack Dromey, who made outrageous statements. Like I think uh, Harriet Harman, most famous for saying that she and don't forget they were lawyers and they were supporting the whole thing through the nccl hold on a second can you just uh, oh, clarify sorry. who they are and what they were campaigning for well harriet harman obviously um she is deputy leader leader i think now or she might not be anymore but she was high up in the labor party um Jack Dromey, another Labour politician, and Patricia Hewitt, another Labour politician, and they were young lawyers at the time um, in the 80s, and they were involved with the NCCL, um, who were involved with Liberty. So these were so-called freedom groups, freedom of expression groups, who were affiliated with the Paedophile Information Exchange. What is that, and what was its mission? Well, Paedophile Information Exchange mission was to legalise sex with children, and that's that. And there's really, and they use lots of nice flowery wording about it, about the beauty of love between adults and children and everything. But it was really about legalizing sex with children. And Harriet Harman most famously said that she wasn't aware that there was any great long term damage done to children who, ha who engaged in sexual relationships with adults. And she is now obviously very, very senior in the Labour Party. Um, and so that was the paedophile information exchange, which is throughout the establishment. They. They, they appeared to disband, but they didn't. What they did was they went underground. They still had their people in parliament and in the establishment who were helping. And, and what we've seen now is a resurfacing of them in a way under the idea of queer theory. And queer theory has become extremely popular. Um, and as I say, I've spent this year making a film about gender. And queer theory is obviously is, that is now LGBTQ. So that's queer. Queer theory is... Support is an academic theory. It is highly unpleasant about, you know, it's far too complex for me to go into now. But, but the bottom line is there is definitely an opening for relations between adults and children within it, right? And the, 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 the boundaries and the barriers being erased as well and bringing down the age of consent, right? Now, when I say this is in the establishment, I'm not messing around, okay? I will give you a real life situation that has just happened involving the National Society for the Protection of Children, right? NSPCC. In summer of this year, a, uh, a trans-identified male called Munro Bergdorf, trans woman, um, announced that they had become an advisor at NSPCC. Well, I went mad because I know about Munro's history. This is somebody who you only need to do a cursory search on Google and you will find image after image, which is pornographic. And this was an advisor to NSPCC. Anyway, we made a complaint, said, what on earth is Munro Bergdorf doing advising children? And they release Munro Bergdorf. But we went deeper and we discovered that the person who had brought Munro into NSPCC was a guy called, I believe, James Making. And James Making had published photos online of him in his rubber suit masturbating saying i'm at work in the toilet right he was at nspcc masturbating in the toilet in his rubber suit right he sacked and it, we, we, we we exerted pressure great people that i work with you know exerted oh, pressure good job. this is happening this is happening around us now so the these people are in schools. They are not no longer teaching children sex education, right? They are teaching children how to do porn better. That's what they're teaching children. There's schools, Birmingham, Warwickshire, they brought in this group called Respect Yourself. They claimed it was to protect children who had been subjected to porn. No, it wasn't. The information they were giving children was how to do porn better. No 
12 year old needs to know about felching trust me right and this is what they were telling them they were telling them the most horrendous horrendous stuff that's now been withdrawn this was warrington did you say this was warwickshire oh warwickshire okay yeah this is happening all over though this is happening all over and the problem is you speak out about it and they say you're transphobic you're you're a gay basher no 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 i i protect children that's what i do and actually what they're doing what stonewall has done which is the main charity overseeing the whole thing what they've done is actually played into the old narrative that gay men are paedophiles. They have played into that narrative rather than actually protect the gays and lesbians under their banner. They've thrown them to the wolf and they've played into that narrative and they've supported the likes of people like James Makin to go into a loo at his workplace and wank for the cameras. That's what they do. They support all this. You see you see commentators online, left wing, con the left has lost the plot. That's why I say I cannot be part of the left anymore because the left has lost the plot when it comes to child safeguarding. They absolutely have. And Jeremy Corbyn still needs to be asked about his role in child safeguarding in Islington. He absolutely does. He did nothing about the children that were being abused in Islington. He was made aware of it and he's done nothing. And Jeremy Corbyn is literally... I voted for him first time around, won't do it again. But Jeremy Corbyn now has pl played into the whole idea that um, men can become women and uh, women are being removed from parliament and being replaced by men who call themselves women. And that's all going on. And we've got the... Uh, one of the women that I interviewed in my documentary is a woman called Helen Watts who had worked for the guides for a very long time. Her mum was in the guides. They've been brown houses in their family. It was historic. She has been banned from the guides for looking at their policy, which allows young boys to self-ID as girls, go off on the camping trips with the with the girls. But more than that, for men to self-ID as women and go off on these weekend camping trips with young girls and the parents are not allowed to be notified. And Helen blew the whistle. I am not saying every man who has gender identity issues is a paedophile. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that people like the paedophile information exchange have seen a gap where the whole issue of transgender and gender has come and they're leaping into it. I've just today on the way here taken a call from somebody about a prison just down the road from here, Downview Prison in Sutton, which is the UK's first transgender prison. And they put a rapist in there who's already sexually abused a woman. A rapist calling himself a woman. So what I'm saying is that there are loopholes which which are even up until today are establishment protected. And this is another one, right? So our children, it has it has progressed from paedophile information exchange to literally we have people running our so-called child safeguarding agencies who are highly questionable. Oh, it's blown my mind. I've never even heard of some of this stuff. So you're saying that a horny boy could just tell his teacher or Kara's I identify as a woman sure. and get assigned to sleep with the women and then could rape them. We live in a we now live in a trans affirmative society. Anything else is perceived as transphobic. So one case that I report on in the trans doc is where a seven year old girl came home from school a summer holiday with a note saying that when she went back to school, she would no longer be referred to as a girl. She was now going to be a boy. Her records would reflect that she was a boy. And that was that. And the parents can are like stymied. So that is happening. That's happening all over. We've got that happening everywhere. I mean, you know, you only have to look, Google Karen White. Karen White is, you know, a sex attacker who was given access to women by claiming he's a woman. So, you know, this this is a loophole. And again, I say it's really important to stress not everybody who's transgender is a sex attacker, but it's a loophole. If you can just say, I'm a woman, get me into women's spaces. That's a loophole. Like go get into women's toilets. And women's toilets, women's refuges where women are most vulnerable. Women's prisons where women are most vulnerable, right? Women's sports, come on. You know, we're seeing it all over. But I hate that, that's unjust. But I'm more worried about the indoctrination that's taking place with our children in terms of the sex education that they're receiving. It is very much about removing natural boundaries and barriers from children. The advice, the guidance in schools is if a little girl is not prepared to share a loo with a boy who calls himself a girl, the little girl must be found another place to go to toilet, right? So this is about telling girls that 
their no doesn't mean anything. This is all about making children more vulnerable and the, and our establishment is fully supporting it. So we, I've said this for years, England, the UK has a child care issue. We don't care for children. We don't. We get soppy and we claim to and we see children in need and we go, oh, those poor impoverished little children. We don't care for children. I care for children. You care for children. But as a society, we don't care for children. We are negligent with children. Our laws do not protect children. And we need to make sure that they do. And we need to start looking at who is working with children because obviously the greatest disguise that you can have as a paedophile, and we've seen it, is to work with children. So you said that the left-wing newspapers have dropped the ball with completely. child protection. Oh, completely. What about politics then? Because Epstein got his sweetheart deal under Obama Clinton. We've obviously got Hillary, Secretary of State, protecting Bill. Now, it came about under Trump's administration. Are there more um, prosecutions coming about under a right-wing Ooh, president and i'm not saying i support interesting. any of the presidents of america mm. i look at them all as mafia dons that compete yeah, against yeah, each yeah, other absolutely. with the, with the but clintons and the bushes agendas, working together but they've got slightly different agendas so, so every now and again they don't overlap and that's where you get the gap where they're prepared to push through and you know and, and nail somebody does, does trump have an interest in allowing the epstein stuff to come forward in the federal court system because that puts pressure on the clintons well it's difficult to know because how involved is trump I mean, this is the thing. How involved is Trump? It is really difficult. I, I would tend to say, look, I think for me, it's really clear that, that Trump has certain issues that he wants to wants to promote. So, for example, he wants to highlight the issues of vaccinations, for one example, and potential issues to do with autism. And he's done that actually very successfully. So I think he has certain certain agendas, but I think that he is no more capable of protecting children than any other president before him or indeed after him, because they're all in the same shitty boat. <laughs> you know, one way or another, they all are involved in each other. They are all complicit. You don't have to be a child abuser to be complicit because we've already covered that. If You just need to have knowledge of it. And to me, you're as bad as the abuser. So no matter what the power play, yeah. at the end of the day, the children aren't getting protected. That's, that's no, they're not. Point. Not the at all. Absolutely 100% not at all. Going back to UK politicians then, Ken Clark. Oh, God. Who Who is Ken Clark for young people who don't even know and what was his role? Ken Clark was a Tory minister, had many great positions within government, within Thatcher's government. Um, well, there's two things on Ken Clark. One thing on Ken Clark was Ken Clark, I will state here and now, is completely complicit in the uh, contaminated blood scandal. Um, he was... So you've, you've mentioned that before, yeah. and I've written about a contaminated blood uh, scandal out of Arkansas. Um, I don't know if, 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 if they, they tie together. What is the blood scandal well, you're talking is, about? There is now an inquiry about it. Contaminated blood scandal is where people were actually given contaminated blood from America, HIV blood. This is the blood I've been writing about. It, it was Clinton. Well, it was Ken Clark. Under, um, as the governor of Arkansas that kept that program going the longest. They were right. selling the prisoners' blood. Right. They had AIDS right. and had hepatitis and they knew it. Right, absolutely. And they hepatitis. kept it going after they knew it. And all over the world, people died. Well, there's a video online of me finally losing it about four years ago. I was with a man called Glenn from the Contaminated Blood Scandal. We'd gone to Oxford where David Cameron was still prime minister and he was having a surgery and he'd agreed to meet them. And at last minute, he changed his mind, didn't want to meet them. So imagine this is Glenn. He's He doesn't just run the contaminated blood. He's got contaminated blood, right? So this is like the, he doesn't even know how long he's going to live for. And I'm thinking... We're not, this is not okay. And I said to him, what do you want to do? He said, well, I, really, I'd like to go to David Cameron. And I said, well, then that's what we're going to do. So we got in the car and we drove him to David Cameron's house <laughs> where two armed guards, it's all online, you'll, you'll see it, we're down a country I lane. filmed it. He's still filmed. <laughs> There's two armed guards with like guns like this, right? Me and my poor cameraman. And, and I was like saying to them, you know, basically... This man, we need to leave this, these documents, Dave Cameron. They're like, don't put it on the door. And I'm like, I'm going to. They literally could have killed us there and then and nobody would have known anything. We were down a country lane in his little Oxford pad and everything. There's two armed guards and I shoved the paperwork. And 
my God. I'll tell you what, Sean, it was one of the greatest moments because I looked around and Glenn looked like he, I actually feel quite emotional. Oh. Because Glenn looked like somebody had finally listened to him. And that wow. was a really wonderful feeling. Months, three, four months later, they announced that there was going to be the contaminated blood inquiry. So that was really amazing. So I'll always do stuff like that, always, because you, sometimes you have to take it to the man. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Props to you for doing that. Did the inquiry amount to anything? Well, it's still, it's still ongoing. Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. They're quite clear that this is contaminated blood um, and that has been, you know, was deliberately given to them. Absolutely. Yeah. That's quite clear now. Um, and that was HIV and hepatitis as well. Terrible. But yeah. Ken, so going back to it, Ken Clark was very, I think he was the health minister at the time. He was very involved with that. But more in terms of paedophiles in parliament, Ken Clark was also accused of sexually assaulting Ben Fellows. Now, what's really curious about this is that Ben Ben has just disappeared now, I think. But this goes back a long time to when David Cameron was running Carlton TV and people said that David Cameron had hidden information of child abuse that had taken place and everything. And that's why he was given the... I didn't... I don't believe that. That's where I think some people overstretch and it loses credibility, right? He did work for Carlton and I have no doubt that he had people who he was protecting there, but you don't go from Carlton and just become prime minister. It's not really how it works, right? And I'm not necessarily saying we work in a completely legal democracy, but I don't believe for a second that story. And I do think that that discredits what took place. But anyway, Ken Clark was involved in an interview Ben Fellows worked for the production company and Ben Fellows said that as he was about 18 or 19, Ken Clark touched him sexually. Um, Ken Clark always said it wasn't true, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't true. But here's where it gets interesting is that um, Ben was eventually taken to court for this um, and he was found not guilty. So for me, logically, if Ben was found not guilty for, so he didn't lie about Ken Clark, that suggests to me that the judiciary believes there is a case for Ken Clark to answer. Well, why isn't he in the dock then? That seems like a logical conclusion. I'm not a lawyer. I don't claim to be. But if somebody has been found that they haven't lied, then that means that the situation potentially happened, right? But Ken Clark has not. So he's still bobbing around. He's a Tory grandee, you know, living the life still around parliament i see him regularly i chased him down the street i chase all of them <laughs> all of them it's my greatest pleasure in life um and he ran under ropes to get away from me and all i said was ben fellows and i thought he was going to pass out on the pavement <laughs> so these are people who are still around our parliament that we're still paying for who have questions to answer about the systemic and maintained abuse of children over many decades what was operation you tree and has that oh. done any good for society I don't think any of these have because what Operation U Tree did was basically brought in a load of 70s entertainers, entertainers who they said were, see, isn't it interesting? We, I'm not saying that these people weren't. I'm absolutely sure they were, you know, whether it was a guy who ran It's a Knockout or whomever. They've all been done, haven't they? Everybody I watched on TV as a kid was on, in that. But isn't it curious that the whole point about this was that Jimmy, this started, you tree and everything started as a consequence of the Jimmy Savile revelations of Tom Watson standing up in the Houses of Parliament and saying that he had intelligence that there was a paedophile ring linked to Parliament and David Cameron saying, we were looking into this and then you've got you, all the investigations came about, you know, you, there was loads of them. But U Tree essentially went after all the 70s entertainers and I only laugh, not because I think it's funny, it's just because I can't believe that we keep sucking this up. It's like, weren't we supposed to be looking at politicians? How did we end up with that lot? Do you see what I'm saying? It's like sacrificial lambs. Always. And it's not it's not okay. They're literally that since 2012, there has not been one arrest, one conviction of a politician. And it even statistically, it's not possible that there aren't paedophiles walking around Parliament. Even statistically. And Max Clifford, thoughts on him? Oh. Max Clifford, uh, was almost certainly also involved in the abuse of young people. Uh, but more importantly than that, 
Max's job was to keep the lid on everybody else's dirty secrets. He even admitted it. He admitted that he knew about um, the politician and the, the the mother and the daughter. Oh, what politician was that? God, there's a YouTube online. Google it. Max Clifford, where he actually admits that he covered up the secret. And he basically makes this teenage girl who's like 13 sound like a whore. It's Because that's what they do. Virginia Roberts and all that, they, 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 they're just disposable whores to these people. That's all that, that's how they see them. They don't see them as human beings, obviously. They're disposable. Max Clifford should have been banged up long time ago, long time ago. Uh, he, he should not have been allowed to die without, well, I know he was eventually banged up, but he, he had a very good run, a very good run. And he went to his grave with lots of people's secrets. Do you think his run was so good because of, he had those secrets? Yes, 100%. And, and why um, didn't he threaten to release those secrets to prevent his incarceration? Well, that's why I believe that he was probably more involved than we were led to believe. And actually, I believe that any revelations would have probably implicated him even deeper in it. And that would have probably resulted in a longer, longer jail term. So I think it was all about self-protection. These people are only about self-protection. So what, what was his cause of death? Do you know? Oh, was he Epstein? I can't remember. I can't remember. There was a lot of I can't remember. I haven't I haven't looked at him for a while now. There's all kinds of ways of making people die well, in prison. The problem is, there's already something iffy about somebody dying in prison, right? Whoever you are, right? I've done enough work of people dying in prisons to know there's a problem when people die in prisons, right? It's it's not the most common thing to occur unless you're in for life. Obviously, there's a whole different story. But generally, when a uh, you know, a high category prisoner suddenly dies, Fred West, Epstein, or there has to be question Kenneth marks Lay. over it. Exactly. There has to be question marks over it. The, there's no way I would ever believe that Epstein died through suicide. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And I won't allow them to gaslight me like that either. That's gaslighting if we accept that kind of nonsense. Elm Guesthouse trial. Oh, dear. Well, that was a mess. That was deliberately a mess. What then. happened at the Elm Guesthouse? Well, what, I, what, what is said to have happened is certainly there were, they had these things called uh, Sunday night sauna parties. And uh, Elm Guesthouse is in Rocks Lane in Barnes in southwest London. And I don't know if you've ever been down there, but um, when you go to these places, there's something, you've sensed something in the air. There's something in the air. There's something just not right. So we filmed outside Elm Guest House and everything. But f for many years, that was a, that was basically, it was advertised as a sort of safe place for gay men to go to at a time when being gay was more problematic than it is now. So many gay men politicians in the establishment, they did need safe environments to be able to go to. That is absolutely true. I don't doubt that at all, in order just to be able to live the, their lives. However, there were children involved. There were definitely children involved. Files weren't missing. I mean, it was so ridiculous. And then, of course, obviously, the owner of Elm Guest House, she died in very suspicious circumstances so, so, so as well. You, so you said this guest house was a place where gay people could go and feel safe and that they had a community. Yes. But there were children involved. There now, were. Now, when you say there were children involved, you're saying... They were gay kids who went there for safety? Or are you saying kids were brought in to be abused? Kids were brought in. I interviewed one man who was actually taken in. For, and I have no reason to dispute what he said because I've talked to him over a period of about six years now. And again, as with my other contacts, I throw things in the mix to see if stories change. If people are consistent with a the story, then they're not, you know, th that's the thing about lying, isn't it? You've got to have a good memory. And if people are consistent with a story, it generally tells me, and my gut instinct as well, I've been a journalist a long time, I could generally tell when people are being, but one, one man told me about how he and other children were bussed in from a care home, and I think that was in Cheshire. There was, there was some from North Wales as well. And he was driven on a sunshine coach. Do you remember those sunshine coaches? Mm -hmm. They were for disabled children. He was mm -hmm. driven on a sunshine coach to Elm Guest House in a fairy costume, right? And it was, it, all these men would congregate of, well, different nights, but mostly Sunday nights. That was the big night. And they were all different rooms and they'd go off and have saunas with these kids and they would abuse them. And Now, bear in mind, some, now some of the problems, the pains that some of these boys certainly have with these memories and about telling the truth is they were humiliated. 
they were humiliated by these people but not only that they some some people have very confused memories because when i'm going to call him jake that's not his name i'm going to call him jake just for ease one of the things that jake said to me was that he felt bad for many years because he felt that by being they were always told when you're selected to go from the homes you're one of the good ones you're one of the special ones you're a star they took these kids out they took them to places like elm guest house they plied them with drink and drugs these kids coming from the backgrounds they were they felt like they were special so some of them have lived with years of guilt of feeling they brought it on themselves this is very common with child abuse victims and that's one of the problems that we have dealing with child abuse is that people take too much on board themselves so some of these kids believed that it was their fault they were dressed up in fairy costumes and paraded around Cyril Smith and other politicians and abused and you know masturbated on that that they had encouraged it because on one side they were like oh they were so happy to be out they were groomed they were groomed to believe that if you were selected you were a special one and anything else that came was just that was the payment mm. do you understand how complicated yeah. it is yeah. I've, I've interviewed a lot of people on this podcast and they were in foster homes and things happened to them. And behind a lot of crimes, there's a childhood tragedy. Of course. And hearing what they went through, um, just really, oh, it's just, just gut-wrenching. Oh, it makes me so angry. Yeah. I, 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 I think I'm sort of made up of uh, sort of 80%, you know, fuming and 20% okay we're just going to sort this but I, I live a lot of my life raging at the system I really do and I've had to step back from that and you know and I do all manner of things and I meditate and do everything I can because I, I need to keep balance but I'm so angry at what we have allowed to happen and continue to allow to happen and it's really important that we see when I say we have a child care problem it's really important to see some people say well we've got the Muslim gangs and we've got paedophiles. No, we've got them all. They're all paedophiles, yeah? We don't need to look at one just because it serves, you know, somebody to to grind a political axe against a, a Muslim gang. They're all the same problem. And a lot of the time, these Muslim gangs are completely enabled by the local councils who are also complicit, who are also then tied up with obviously local lords, with local establishment, and then tied up to central government. It's they're all tied. They're all together. They're all in together. That's exactly what Maggie Oliver said. And yeah. she, she quit the force in disgust because the victims that she'd promised certain things to were basically just used by yeah. the court system yeah. and tossed aside. Yeah, I know. And they criminalized one of the victims to the point where Child Protective Services were going to take her children from her. Yeah. It's shocking. Well, they're doing that now with the, the the issue of gender as well. And that is if parents are not prepared to be trans affirmative of their children, there is a threat of social services now being involved. So the state is truly getting involved with our children in ways that are really unwholesome and we are allowing it. So the, the documentary talked about a lady called Vichelle. My documentary? Paedophiles in Parliament. Vichelle? Wasn't there a Vichelle? I've written it down here. Vichelle's murder. Oh, no, Vichelle. Vichelle, that was, that was the, the young boy who went missing. Oh, no, sorry, not a woman, a young boy. Okay. Well, he went missing and that was around Elm Guest House. And he went missing on the day of the royal wedding, which was, what, 25th of July, whenever it was that Charles and Diana got married. But he went missing on that afternoon. Now, this is where it starts to get very, very involved and very detailed. And I won't make it too complex. But basically, he went missing. And there is every reason to believe that I've talked with police who are still investigating and they believe that there were a number of very high profile paedophiles who were operating within the establishment, but weren't part of the establishment, like people like Sidney Cook. Sidney Cook is an infamous child murderer and paedophile who was involved in the murder um, of Jason Swift, a 14-year-old boy. I can't even bear to talk about it, but I'm, I will. 14-year-old boy, I think he was Jason, 14 or 15. He was one of the boys probably from Piccadilly. Um, and Jason was taken to a flat in, I can't remember, it was Hackney or East London somewhere. And he was just like so brutally so brutally raped by this gang who may well be involved with Vishal but there is also every reason to believe that Sidney Cook had involvements with members of the establishment as well so we there are children still missing who are linked to these gangs who are linked to parliament that's where we're at and did Theresa May do anything she made sure that nobody was exposed Theresa May how did she do that 
Um, Dave Eden, the cop who is in paedophiles in Parliament, he uh, went to her. He, well, no, actually, he went to John Hemming. He didn't realise that John Hemming had been accused by Esther Baker, but he knew that John Hemming, Hemming was a receptive MP to issues like that. And he went to John Hemming and told him about his experience about the cover up involving another cop. And a letter was sent to Theresa May, of which I have a copy, um, from John Hemming um, outlining all this. And uh, she did absolutely nothing. Theresa May has been involved in one cover up after another. Theresa May is safe hands. That's all she is. She's just safe hands. Like Hillary Clinton. Yeah, they're just safe hands. So th they're not going to expose it because to expose it would expose themselves. Because if Theresa May suddenly came out and said they've been abusing children for the last 25 years, people would be like, well, how long have you been in parliament? Do you see? That's so They have to protect themselves. So to give the public a sense that they are doing something when they're not really doing something. Absolutely. They have these inquiries, but they put oh. in charge of these inquiries. You had a, li a list of, <laughs> of people, a baroness. That's such ridiculous, such. isn't it? Can you just tell us a bit about the inquiries? Well, the inquiry is ridiculous. I was calling for the inquiry um, and a number of other people as well. And uh, the uh, the best thing to come out of the inquiry is w it shows clearly the relationship between Prince Charles and uh, the paedophile Bishop Ball, who was a paedophile. Prince Charles was aware that there were a number of issues with him and he was busy mates with uh, Peter Ball, the paedophile um, uh, priest. So that's one of the best things to come out of the child abuse inquiry. But generally, I believe it is a bit of a whitewash. They're not looking at things like military abuse, for example, which they should be looking at. Um, then they're not looking at the, the Westminster Strand was a bit weak. That would have been the, the, the sort of paedophiles in parliament kind of thing. Um, but when Theresa May set about doing the inquiry, she literally put the most establishment people in, in charge, you know. Um, I mean, she put uh, she put one woman in charge whose own brother was a politician at the time of Jeffrey Dickens and had been involved, allegedly involved in the cover up, uh, you know. And that so she put a series of people who were all establishment people, Lord Mayors, one woman she put in charge was Leon Britton's neighbour. And they went, you know, dining together and they went to parties together. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying Leon Britton is a paedophile, but what I'm saying is that there were very serious allegations and accusations and you can't bring in somebody's mate to oversee an inquiry like that. Um, so she ended up bringing in Jay, Professor Jay, who was, I think, very good in Rotherham, who's really a former social worker. And I think her intentions are actually good. She was ridiculed by the establishment, of course, because she didn't have necessarily the credentials of a judge, so couldn't necessarily be able to access. I think she's been given them now. But the what was very wrong with the child abuse inquiry is obviously the terms of reference are narrow. And the terms of reference is always key to anything. That's how you're going to find out this, the truth about anything. So they were, they were narrow enough that, I mean, what, what, we've not seen anything. I think the aim of the child abuse inquiry was to basically make those people feel like they're being heard, put them off for five years into a meeting room in London, put it out on Twitter. That's it. I think that was the aim of it. I think it was just to make them, like you say, make it look like something's being done. But in fact, nothing has been done. Oh, it's, it's like it, it makes you lose your hope in the world. Well, but it, it mustn't. It mustn't because there are people like us, you see. It mustn't make you lose your hope because there are good people. There are good people in the system as well. And they get horrible things happen to them like John Wedger. John Wedger said, well, he intimated that um, there just wasn't enough evidence to prosecute certain politicians. So even though the cases haven't gone through the full court process and they're saying, well, that proves I'm innocent. It doesn't because he believes people like Liam Britton from what he knew, mm. there definitely was, he definitely was active. Janna, I mean, Lord Janna was an outrageous situation. He's now dead, right? He was 33 young boys have oh, he, said. He played the senile card, didn't he? Absolutely, absolutely. He went from, in December, turning up every day to the House of Lords and collecting his £300 a day, right? To the minute that they then decided they were the police were going to start investigating him, suddenly he didn't attend the House of Lords anymore and those things, right? 
I'm, I, I cannot, we cannot finish this without talking about Keith Faz, who is a current that's, that's the one serving MP. Yeah. Well, he was very involved in the cover-up of Janna. I believe that Janna was a cover-up, actually. Daniel Janna, his, uh, Janna's son, a lawyer's son, has done everything he can to disrupt the child abuse inquiry. Um, don't forget Boris Johnson described the child abuse inquiry as spaffing money up against a wall. And why would you say that? Well, because you know that it's not going to serve any great purpose, Boris. Um, but uh, Jana was in uh, child child home children's homes in Leicester. He's a Leicester MP for many years. Thirty plus accusations. They quashed that in Parliament. They and Keith Faz was very much involved in the quashing of that in Parliament. Um, and they gave him Jana parliamentary privilege to basically absolve himself of anything. I'm completely innocent. These rumours are awful. And that was it. And what was even worse is in parliamentary privilege, it doesn't give journalists an opportunity to ask questions. So Jana was able to say that. It went down in Hansard and that was it. And Keith Faz was very much behind that. And Keith Faz, let us not forget, is somebody with a whole lot of secrets. A whole lot of secrets. That's another Mr. Teflon. The only thing we know about Keith Faz so far is that he likes Eastern European male prostitutes. That's was on the front pages of Sunday papers. We know that. But we also know that the Sun intimated that it was Keith Faz who liked young boys and called them ragamuffins. So allegedly, allegedly. Keith Faz has managed to skip through the system. I mean, you know, it's really quite amazing. There are some politicians that you can throw anything at them and they, they, they you know, they seem to be able to escape it all. Keith Faz used one of the most uh, high profile libel lawyers to shut down a petition. This guy came to me, said, I've, I've got a petition and I'm sending this petition to Leicester councillors asking for an investigation into Keith Faz's activity. Keith Faz used the same libel lawyers, Carter Ruck, that the McCanns used, the biggest libel lawyers in the UK, to quash that petition. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do that? Oh, so I'd like to end this on kind of the neuroscience of the paedophile mind. And what's oh what's brought me to this is my YouTube channel started out as a prison channel. Right. And I like to, I'm not, I like to like slowly and methodically go through everything, every aspect of a subject. Right. It takes me a long time to do it. I'm not a quick person with things. I'm I'm slow and methodical. So for years, I went over all of the prison stuff. Then I moved over to the war on drugs. And on my channel, people ask me questions. They ask me about Epstein. They ask me about R. Kelly and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's led to this very dark subject matter, which you're an expert on. Well, now, I've watched, now. I've watched two... Um, documentaries on netflix i watched abducted in plain sight mm. which completely blew my mind have you watched that yeah i know I at the weekend i've just watched tell me who i am right have you watched it no oh is it on netflix it's on netflix it's new right and it is twin brothers oh no i've seen the You've outline it. of it You've no i haven't it. seen it i've seen oh. the description of it i watched fractured last I was, night i don't I was, know if you watched fractured that's no, mad as well but. but i was almost in tears so twin brothers, identical twins. You mentioned about these like um, historic estates in Dorset, Salisbury, yeah, these Wiltshire, kind of old, yeah, old, old mansions. Yeah. They were raised in one of them. And one brother gets in an accident in his late teens and he completely loses his memory. So his other brother, who he trusts so much, tells him his life history but leaves out the child sexual abuse. Now, the brother who's done this has done it because he thinks it's in the best interest of his brother not to traumatize him. And also, he's so traumatized himself, he starts to believe the new version. He's managed to hide that so sure. deeply and inside sure. himself. These two twins are not allowed to live in the house. They live in like a, a, like a shed. Um, it's based on true story. Yeah, wow. this this property must be worth about five million. Looking at it, but they live in a, in a in a shed basically. Right. right. And eventually, the father dies. He was a domineering character, and the father says to the, the kids, um, "Do you forgive me?" The son who knows, the son who, who doesn't know, says, "Yeah, of course I forgive you. I love you." But the son who knows says, "No, 
which causes a suspicion in the son who doesn't know. Now, there's still the mum's the still not alive. I mean, I'm sorry, the mum's still alive, but they're not allowed in certain parts of the house. But eventually she dies. And what happens is they, they go into all these parts of the house that they weren't allowed. They find this huge wardrobe full of sex toys. Then they find these other closed off areas and there's like a, a box that's locked. They find the key, they open the box. There's pictures of them as kids, naked. I think they're 10 years old with their heads cut off. And that moment then causes the brother who doesn't know to say to the brother who knows, did mum do something to us? Did she molest us? And he says, yes. And he just, he can't say anything else. He walks out of the room, but everything changes at that point. And I won't tell you what happens in the, in the third section of this, um, because the brother who doesn't know, he demands to know the full details of what went on. And, and they only tell it on camera for the, for the first time. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for the viewers. Right. I highly recommend they watch it. So what, makes a parent do things like that to their own their own, their own kid and it, it was the mother that was doing it in this case what 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 is wrong with the brain why why do pedophiles exist how, oh, how long is a piece of string <laughs> i mean what i will say i'm in no doubt that there is a learned behavior component to pedophilia we see that in actually establishment paedophiles because a lot of these boys have been put through the public school system where they, they are raped. They are raped as initiations, okay? And they are subject to abuse. I mean, it's not just, this is the thing, we've got this idea that it's just children in care homes who are the vulnerable ones. Actually, a lot of the boys in the public schools were really vulnerable as well and were, have been brutally abused and raped. Well, the problem is, is I've studied psychology. I don't claim to know everything about the this at this issue about what makes a paedophile. I don't. I have my own theories about it. And one of the things that I do know, obviously, there is a, a component of learned behaviour. But a lot of the time, people get their sexual kicks from an experience. Uh, these are people who've been abused. Abused from the experience of, of the time it was frozen when they were abused. So that is how they then get their sexual kicks. So for, I'll give you an example. I interviewed um, one woman who claimed to, well, I've interviewed a number of people who've claimed to, to have paedophile, you know, um, desires, which has been very hard to interview people. Um, but this one woman talked about how her kick came from imagining doing exactly the same thing that had been done to her because her like sexual development had frozen at that time when she herself had been abused. This is not a justification for paedophiles. We have choices. I do not believe that paedophiles can't help themselves. I've not come across, I've looked at academic papers. There is nothing to suggest that people cannot control themselves, right? So I do believe people can control themselves. So that is an active choice, right? But I would say this, and I know it's quite controversial, but I do believe that there are more men than we know who have desires for young people. I do believe that. I believe that we need to discuss it as a big subject. We know in evolutionary, um, just, just evolutionary unknown, men are naturally attracted to younger females because they can reproduce, right? So that's just an evolutionary aspect of it. But lots of men are very attracted to schoolgirls, to the imagery. Of you know this is true, Sean. I'm not making this up. And yeah, the, yeah, I agree. I, these, I read a research paper on it at the yeah, weekend. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah. we need. This is what we need to, to discuss. We need to really tackle this, right? About why this is. Why men are attracted to primarily men? Because obviously, nine. The actual current statistics: ninety nine point one percent of sex attackers are men. It's high. It's high. What it said in this paper was, because um, I was particularly interested in the class of paedophiles that go for prepubescent, uh -huh. and what it said was um, they found that the brains were different, that um, the amygdala, right, that also that they couldn't feel the pain of the victims, right. so they could hurt children so they lack empathy. and not have any empathy. Right, right. 
So if they're born with a brain like that for a reason, for example, um, fetal uh, alcohol damage or something Abs like that. that. That is a perfect example. Then there are triggers in the environment you right. talked about. There's a range of things that can activate your genes. Yeah. Getting raped at an independent school, a boarding yeah. school, whatever. Yeah. What degree then of... Like in the court system, they would be mitigating circumstances. I know it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, yeah. What, what, you know, because people could say, all right, I went through all that. Yeah. And I maybe fantasize about these things, but I don't act on it. Yeah. These people that cross the line, you said they've got autonomy. I do believe that they have autonomy. I don't believe that it's a given that just because you were abused, you have to abuse. I don't believe that. I know it's not anyway, it's absolutely not. But, we do make choices, but don't forget that there is a constantly a drive to normalise child abuse because they've gone, they've they've reclassified themselves now as maps, don't forget, minor attracted people. That's a big movement now, mm. right? I've never even heard of that. It, maps, they're on <laughs> all over Twitter. Twitter will get rid of a woman who says a man cannot be a woman. They'll ban her for life, but they'll leave the maps on saying how much they love children. So th they're reclassifying constantly. It is my experience that paedophiles, child abusers, are some of the most cunning people that I've ever encountered, right? They have to be cunning because that's their survival. Nobody who isn't a paedophile approves of them, right? Everybody wants to see them dead or on an island or just away from me, right? I don't know if we could allow for the fact for mitigating circumstances. I really don't. I've talked to people who have been abused. I've talked to people who, who have abused. I've talked to people who have thought of abusing. And not once in any of that did I get the sense, or any of the research I've looked at, did I get the sense that it's an absolute given that just because you've been abused or just because you've got a damaged amygdala or whatever, and I know what the amygdala does, it is not a given. I believe that the book has to stop with you. So if I was a, a judge, there is absolutely no way that I would see, because to me, the moment you become a perpetrator, you're no longer a victim. That's my take on well, it. We've had, I think, almost 10 people on the true crime podcast who have been abused and they are vehemently you know against anything like like that happening and if they had kids they would be really looking out for them do you think that pedophiles then play the card whereby i was abused give me the mitigating sentence they enhance their own abuse perhaps of course it's very useful isn't it i mean that that that's what perpetrators do they always look for how can i lessen what it is i've been found doing that's that's just what human beings do. So I, but I do believe we need to have more intelligent discussions around the issue of child abuse, because at the moment it's all, you know, pitchforks, let's go after them and all of that. And like I say, don't get me wrong. These are not people that I want to protect and support, but I do want to know if there's a way that we can pre prevent further harm from these people. So the research paper said there is such taboo around them, there's a lack of research. Well, there is. That is exactly Thus, it. Instead of lynching and burning them, we've got to study them. Yes. And that will pre protect the future generations of the kids. The problem is, once we study them and once we have their, that conclusion, right, what are we going to do with it then? Because almost 100% of people I've talked to, right, doctors, biologists, everything, they are pretty much all of the opinion that if you're a paedophile, you're a paedophile. It isn't something that you can just switch off thinking that is because that's it's not your sexuality that's that's how you you know that's how you get turned on that's that's the, i know that's a, a leap it's huge it's a huge thing for people who don't abuse children to understand the mentality of a pedophile and i don't want to understand the mentality of a pedophile because the problem is that old saying and that is you look into the abyss too mm. long it starts looking back at you Me right too. and i've had that and i don't want yeah. that so but i want to understand enough so that we can actually protect children in the future i think that constantly tarring and feathering them without actually looking deeper at the motivations or any of those things is unhelpful. I think we need to go deeper into it. I think they should do chemical castration trials. Yes, I agree. I, I agree. I would be pro that as well. But, you know, all that does, chemical castration is, is they say, is loses the drive, right? That doesn't allow for all the other things that make us human beings. I mean, the vet, we have a memory, 
right? And our memories are very, very powerful. You only have to smell something to take you about 30 years. So even if they chemically castrated somebody, who's to say that there isn't then a trigger at some stage that will remind them of something and then it will take them back there? That's why I think the trials would sort yeah, that out. But we need yeah. trials. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need to do something more proactive because we can no longer deny. They can make sure that nobody is brought to book, right? They can keep suiciding off anybody who is going to spill the beans. They can keep doing that. But it doesn't alter the fact that children are still vulnerable. And if we truly care about the protection of children, we have to look closer at those who are harming them in the first place. And in the meantime, I think the police should have a bigger role in this because, you know, I'm a member of law enforcement against prohibition. They say we join the police to arrest pedophiles, murderers, robbers, rapists. But we were sent out to bus kids with weed or to yeah. hand out traffic tickets. Yeah. And it seems like the, the whole purpose of the police force has been subverted, yeah. whereby they're telling us now they don't have the resources to go after pedophiles. But every time I see, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not against the police. I think there's good and bad in every profession, but I think so the people on. at the top have subverted it. I see the police out giving traffic tickets. I see the police out shaking black kids down in London when I'm on the tube, you know, look, searching for weed. They should be going after the paedophiles. I'm, I'm, I filmed a group called We Are Fair Cop for my gender doc. And they are going through a judicial review this month against the police. And it is because the police are uh, basically coming after us for thought crime now. That's what the police are doing. Um, the police are really hot if you misgender somebody, i.e. call a man a woman or whatever, but misgender. They're, they're really hot on misgender. They call that hate crime and they will come after you. I have five people in my documentary who have all been pursued by the police only for correctly labelling somebody's biology only. And in fact, the police called one man, Harry the Owl, who was doing the judicial review, and they said they were calling him to check his thinking after he had retweeted a tweet. So the police are using their resources in all the wrong ways. Nobody needs this. This is a this is top down instruction. The whole that whole thing, hate crime. Hate crime is the best thing that they currently have to silence us all. Right? It's a top down process. That's where a lot of the resources, police resources, are going in at the moment. I know there are good cops because I work with good cops, but there are also. Uh, cops who are so institutionalized, they'll do whatever they, they're, they're told. They won't think outside the box. You know, they won't question the established authority and they are still protecting the establishment. And it must be so frustrating for the good cops to get those assignments. Can you imagine? Mm. Can you imagine when you know that you, you want to go further, you're desperate to go further, but you're just stymied, you're placed in a box and that's that, you know, but we just have to be m really more honest about, you know, our sexual longings, what they're about, why do so, why are so many men sexually attracted to young people? Why is that? And that's what we need to start looking at and tackling. I agree. That's what we need to research. All right. There's going to be a ton of questions for you in the comment section below oh, this. People are going to be demanding to get you back on. I can already tell because you've touched on something that is so... Um, How long have we talked for? We've gone for an hour, uh, two and a half hours. No! We're about to go for Indian food right now. No. You're welcome to come with us. Oh my goodness. Um, but before we sign off, let's, let's give our final message to the audience out there here. Um, is there anything you would like to say in closing to people out there, maybe who are victims of child sex abuse, parents who are concerned, police who are watching this? There's going to be a variety of people watching it. Is it have you got something to say? Well, first of all, um, please don't be um, put off by the fact that we have suddenly decided that child abuse claims are to be discredited. That is a natural part of the process when the establishment is under attack and it will fight back like that. So please don't be put off. There are many people who are prepared to listen to your story. Um, you can feel free to contact me. I'm I, I won't play games. I'll be very, very honest with you. And I'll ask you if you if you want to step into my arena and, and try and get me involved in some way, I will ask you searing questions. I'll pull no punches. But I do that primarily to actually protect you and your story rather than that laissez-faire attitude I talked about earlier about journalists who are just accepting anything because then that enables everybody else to be discredited. So feel free to contact me. I, I'm off in touch with many uh, survivors groups as well. I can certainly reroute you to somebody. But ultimately, you know, silence is complicity. Silence is what enables 
these situations to keep occurring decade after decade. And I'm not forcing anybody to speak about their experience who aren't ready for it. But just know that it is silence that the establishment requires yet again, which is why they have had people, very convenient people like Carl Beach. And yours may be a story that actually opens up the whole thing. So please, if you feel able to come forward, I am a receptive character to approach, but I'll pull no punches. So in the description box below this video are all the links to Sonia's work and the videos on YouTube we described today. I'll find the Madeleine McCann stuff, put that down there. We've got um, Peter Files in Parliament uh, link down there as well. So we can put whatever contact information you prefer below this video. Right. Would that be your email? Would that be links? Would that be Email's Twitter? fine. Yeah, absolutely. You can find me on Twitter um, and uh, where I'm very active. I'm fairly active on Twitter. But uh, yeah, I mean, email, Twitter, anything, you know, just say, I saw you on Sean's, Sean's video and, um, and we can take it from there, really. But don't be discouraged. That's the whole point about this. The whole point about what has taken place and the discrediting of people, I believe, is to discourage people from coming forward. But what I would like it to be is to serve as some sort of indicator that we need to double down and come after them with all our might this time and not allow them to, you know, sweep it under the carpet like they've done every decade before. So if you've got questions for Sonia, please put them in the comments box. I'm going to go away now. I'm going to watch these other two documentaries about Madeleine McCann. I'll end up with a slew of new questions. <laughs> Hopefully we can talk Sonia into coming back on the podcast next year. Well, thank so, you. Yeah, thank yeah, you, yeah, Sean. It's been an absolute yeah, pleasure. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you too. Thank yeah. you.